that Wanda Smith interview, for no reason, Cat brings up me, Gerard, and Hannibal Burris. Real, real, yeah, they gonna make you a star, Lil Real, but you ugly. Look, I don't think I'm the finest nigga in the world, but a short nigga with a perm. Man, you know he gonna see this and respond. I don't give a fuck. Y'all know how All my life, been grinding all my life. Sacrifice, hustle, pay the price. Want a slice, got to roll the dice. That's why, all my life, I've been grinding all my life. Look, all my life, been grinding all my life. Sacrifice, hustle, pay the price. Want a slice, got to roll the dice. That's why, all my life, I've been grinding all my life. Hello, welcome to another edition of Club Shay Shay. I am your host, Shannon Sharp. I'm also the proprietor of Club Shay Shay. The guy that's stopping by for conversation on the drink today is a heavyweight and a veteran of the game. He was once the best comedian performance at uh, MTV Movie and Television Awards. He's a two-time NAACP Image Award nominee, crowned Bernie Mac Comedy King of the Year, well-respected comedian, actor, writer, executive producer, iconic personality, a host, a loving father, a superstar, Lil Real Howard. <laughs> How was that intro? You, did I leave out anything? I can, I can, I got a pen right quick. You know something? You left out glasses. My, no, I'm joking. I, yeah, no, that's perfect. Hold on. I know you just didn't put British Knight up on my table. <laughs> you put some BKs up on the table, man. You know what? I'm going to tell you something crazy about this. So I just got these. So I was on Instagram one day. Tabitha Brown, which yeah. one, of, one of my, my friends, bought these for her husband. Right. I hit her up like, yo, where did you find British Knight? I've been looking for British Knights, actually. Why? And, Cause I'm, you know, that's nostalgia. I grew up in the nineties. You know yes. I mean? So like the BKs is a real thing. And so right. Like she told me to go on Amazon. I went and ordered a bunch of them, but then I had my old address attached to Amazon because I don't usually order from Amazon. Right. So all the shoes went to like the, an address, address, two addresses ago. Right. So I just got all these British nights. So I'm finna just be rocking them. All okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 How you found? Um, you know, I know you don't drink, but you uh, you got some water. What about water? Oh, perfect. I'll take that water. Thank you so much. But I still want one of these bottles. Yeah, we got you. House. We got you covered. Thanks for stopping by. Can I say this real quick? I'm sure you can. Before I got here today, how much like, <laughs> like you in my life way too much. So I get up and watch First Take in the morning, right? We appreciate that. And then after that, I end up watching like either like Club Shay Shay stuff or like clips and stuff. And then later on, I watch you and Ocho. Ocho. And last night, I got like a binge and then I listened to it last night before I went to sleep. Right. Y'all did the last minute thing. Yeah. It happened yesterday. But I'm like, yo, Shannon's way too attached to my life. Like I, every day, I'm watching you, which is kind of crazy. Well, that's a good thing. I appreciate that. I hadn't seen you since we did that. Uh, You remember we did? Not uh, another sports show. Mm -hmm. I you, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, thanks for stopping by the club, man. I really appreciate that. I know you're busy, <laughs> but to give me a, but give me a couple of minutes of your time, I really, really appreciate that. Thank you. You're from Shy, growing up on the west side of Chicago. Mm -hmm. What did Lil Rail want to be when he was a kid? Um, a couple of things. So, like, <laughs> I was a big fan of the show Different World. Okay, yes. So I wanted to be Dwayne Wayne, like okay. the character. Yeah, right, right. Computer engineer, mm -hmm. whatever that character was, is what I wanted to be. Uh, which is really a funny story because I actually wrote the show one time mm -hmm. and I wrote Dwayne Wayne. Right. I didn't necessarily write Kadeem Hardison. Right. And the postcard I got, I'm like 10 years old, is Kadeem Hardison sitting on a motorcycle with no glasses on. So it wasn't Dwayne Wayne. Right. It was the actor. It was, it was the actor. Okay. <laughs> my father was like, well, you why you got this dude right. sitting there with a motorcycle? He, he's sitting on a motorcycle with his legs right. open like right. this. And I'm a kid. Right. I'm like, this ain't, this, this ain't, this ain't appropriate. Dwayne Wayne. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. So you wanted to be on the show or you just wanted to be the character? I wanted to be Dwayne Wayne. Okay. Because right? I wore glasses like really early on as a kid. So he was just cool. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. He had the cool flip shades. And he wore all right. types of Jordans and he had the cool jerseys on all right. the time. And he was really smart. You know what I'm saying? So like, I like different world had a lot of influence on the way I saw the world, which is really right. interesting. Great show. So what was it like growing up on the west side of Chicago back, like you said, back in the 90s for kids? Uh, the 90s was kind of crazy. I, I look at like, like when you think about like when you come from certain environments and you just used to stuff. Right. I remember like, and this is real talk, at one point losing classmates every year. And that was a normal thing to me. Like somebody like 14 or 15 dying. Right. And so like, until I like, I'm, you know, I traveled the world and moved and I was just telling people my background. They're right. like, wait, like kids was like getting killed. Right. Like all the time. Like, oh, I ain't think about it like that. Right. That was just some. That was a normal occurrence for you. Occurrence. Like every year, but we had a rest in peace. Right. At the end of it. And so like, you know, but I grew up with a dope family. So like what, what kept me 
out of the streets is just, I had an, I got an amazing family. Right. Like my, I had both my parents growing up who were very active in the community also, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? My mother and father, and then my aunts, my uncles. And so I, like I had a great village around me right. that made sure that we didn't get into any trouble and a family full of educators. Right. You mentioned growing up on the west side of Chicago, yeah. you saw a lot of classmates lose their life early on. Mm -hmm. How did you avoid the gang life? My parents, my father, my father, you know, being present mm -hmm. and making sure that it wasn't even tempting to mm -hmm. us, you know what I'm saying? I remember the summer, like, it was one summer where, like, everybody, like, you could tell all of us were starting to grow up and, like, every, felt like everybody joined the gang. Right. Saying. Like, it was kind of crazy. Right. Like, we, we started out just, you know, going to the basketball court and right. playing, and one day, it just felt like everybody literally, you know, I'm not even lying about this. Right. Like, it was kind of weird now that I think about it. It's like, damn, everybody, like, literally became, like, right. these little young adults, right. you know, joining the game. I remember my father watching it kind of happen in the neighborhood, and, it, you know, he just sitting us down, like, me and my brother's like, yo, you know, this is not your life. You know right. what I'm saying? If anybody come talk to you, y'all come talk to me, too. Right. Let me know if somebody even ask. And what's funny, my father was well-respected as far as, like, a, a dad. Mm -hmm. So... They wouldn't even approach us with any of this stuff. Why do you think those those kids, your your classmates, your friends, you like you said, you're going to the basketball court, you're just a normal kid, all of a sudden chose to join that life? They, whether they felt the need to be a part of something, where there's something missing in their life, maybe a father, mother, something. Why do you think they joined the game? The one thing everybody don't talk about a lot of times, I think, you know, you hear these the stories of like, oh, they don't have a father at home and that's why they're doing this and that. But a lot of stuff is kind of like kind of generational. Okay. So if your big cousins and them, that's what they doing, you know what I'm saying? Right. You at a certain age and then they actually do the same, same thing. That happened a lot then. Like okay. a lot of times people don't realize like it was lineage. Right. In <laughs> Chicago gay life. Right. It was just like some random, they right. weren't orphans or nothing. Correct. Okay. It was people in their family already gay banging. You know what right. I'm saying? It felt like, all right, this is what it is. So you, so it's a lot of things that happen kind of traditionally, to be honest with you. Did you ever get into a fight? Did you get jumped? Did, how did, I mean, I mean, you around it, so yeah, I mean, you can't help but, the, you know, fights happen, uh, you know, I'm, <laughs> yeah, it's been quite a few fights and like it, it being robbed is like a regular thing. Cause some of the stuff, you know, back then they used to make people do stuff when they first joined. Right. Like I remember coming from school one day and somebody robbed me for like my Payless gym shoe. He wasn't even name brand, <laughs> but he had to do it. You know what I'm saying? And so like. Was it those British night? First of all, British Nice was I'm just, I'm just saying, can I mean, British I'm big, Nice was a name brand shit. I know. I mean, there maybe there's some <laughs> a nostalgic breakdown that's going on that made you oh, order no, another pair. Somebody stole some pro wings. Okay. You know, you know they were supposed to be a right. nice, but they had like the full stock. Like, come on, either, pay less. Yeah. So, yeah, somebody stole my hard bottom pay less shoes. Right. Which they were real hard. People don't really pay less shoes, but like, they was like loud. Cause I used to run track in them. So, like, you could hear me like literally running on the track. How you run track at hard bottoms? Because it's, my mother was, my mother and father was not going to buy Nike. They did, they refused to pay over $20 for a pair of gym shoes. Right. And I, I mean, I understood now, but at that time, it was like, you know, we had like, you remember we used to make the, the Reebok pumps? Yeah, yeah. The Payless pumps, you couldn't pump them, it was just a big basketball on <laughs> yeah, I remember, I remember, I remember those. <laughs> and you just wanted because you probably saw a lot of the other kids, regardless of how they got the shoes, yeah. they had the shoes. Yeah. And as a kid, you want what you see. Yeah. Everybody else has it. And your mom like, nah, bro, nah, nah, son, we, we, we're not doing that. And I, I, you know, weirdly enough, I understood that it was still a little irritating. It was always kind of embarrassing. You know, he was a kid. Right. But, but for the most part, I, but I understood though. Like they just, they rather invest the money into other things. Right. You know what I'm saying? If that's in like after school program, cause we did a lot of activities growing up. So like that was the investment. And then like for me, I ended up going to like private school kind of early, uh, uh, all black private school on the West side of Chicago, mm -hmm. probably St. Mill, which I believe help mold my life um that, yeah it did actually because that's why i got a chance to go to camp in the summers mm -hmm. and like like dealing with white people for the first time like mm -hmm. I remember the first camp i went to was like literally i was the only black kid that me and the other kid in my school right and so it felt like i got dropped it to save by the bill <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> and so it was it was the it was a weird i remember it was a culture shock almost like what they what they thought was dope name brand was right. i remember like Showing up, you know, I, you know, I asked my parents to give me some Nike stuff, and they were wearing Ombros. That right. was like the thing. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize like, yeah. what the hell is an Ombro. I never, I never even heard of Ombros. Right. And it was like a culture shock, honestly. But I learned a lot. I got a chance to go camping and learn how to water ski and all this stuff. But this was what's funny about that, like being around all those white people. I didn't realize my dialect changed. So when I got back home to the West Side of Chicago, 
I thought slavery happened again. Everybody literally sounded right. like I thought something happened because I, you know, I was hearing this dialect the whole summer. Yes. And then you know, get back, back home. You like start talking about I was talking white and all this other stuff, and I didn't know any of that. I thought I was still sounding exactly the same way, but you know, it's it's really association brought on assimilation. Yeah. That's interesting. I didn't realize that was a thing. Right. You know what I mean? But that really, that happened. I mean, because you know, most people that go to London for like a year and they come yeah. back and they got like these British right. accents. Right. <laughs> or like Madonna. <laughs> <laughs> Were you a class ca clown? <sighs> yeah, no, right? The funniest people in my class was my friend. Okay. Like some of the class clowns were like some of my closest homeboys. Now, with me, I just love, I really love comedy i love comedy since i was like 10 years old i started watching like snl really early and you know i'm a church boy so like i used to kind of stay up on saturday nights to watch like these random shows that came out after saturday night live mm -hmm. there's a show called quick wits that came on and wayne brady was on there's a <laughs> random show and uh shout out to uh um louis anderson used to host a stand-up series that came on like one in the morning and some of the cast is like these huge superstars now with like new comics on there. And I used to watch it. Uh, but no, God rest Louis Anderson. So I mean, when I got a chance to meet him, I got a chance to tell him I watched the show. He was like, you know, how old are you? Right. You know, because I, mean? I was yeah. like, no, I used to step and watch the stand up series you hosted. And uh, so I, I've been I wasn't a class clown, but I love comedy. Right. You know, so like I've always studied like I tell people all the time, I feel like I got a master's degree in stand-up comedy. Because I was about to ask you, how did that play with your parents? Because you said both of your parents were there and they seemed to be uh, uh, get your work, very hardworking people, no nonsense. You go to school to learn, you don't go to school to, 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 to play a mess around. And so I was gonna ask, how did that play out with them? That's funny because they didn't realize I was funny till I started doing stand-up. Okay. But they didn't realize, it feel like it was separated. Like you only act a certain way around your parents. Mm -hmm. So my silliness and all that stuff was around like friends. And really my little brother, Matt, I love him to death. He's been my muse since he's been a little kid. Mm -hmm. So to anybody I've ever like tried, to this day, we'll be on the phone for hours. And I, I sometimes- You try material out on not him. Not even knowing it, but if he's laughing really hard at something, I'm like, man, I gotta like, I might have keep that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he's been my muse, but no, I never acted like that in front of my parents. My mother really know how much I did stand up till she actually went and saw me do stand up, which is crazy. Growing up, your height, your size, skin complexion. Yeah. They call it, they call it bullying. We call it picking. Yeah. How much uh, was that in your life? Oh, it was a lot of, I mean, you know, we chocolate brothers, so we heard every, you know, African booty scratches. Ah! You know I mean? <laughs> <laughs> it would, you know, I've heard the worst of the worst, you know what I'm saying? But like, and this is the thing about, you got to add on, I wore glasses. You right. Know, I had, my mom always put the Vaseline, so I was always really greasy and shiny all the time. Uh, but she had me really confident. Like, I believed in myself. Like, the way I look now is how I, I couldn't, I look exactly how I imagined myself to look. Because the way my mother was always like, she always made me feel like I was handsome and I was really smart no matter what, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And I've had moments where like I came home crying because I was being picked on one day. And, um, you know, I'll never forget this, this is real shit. She was just like, you know, one day these kids still talking crazy to you, they are gonna see your name in lights one day. Right. You know, mm -hmm. I ain't think much of it when she used to say that stuff, but like she was always encouraging me that like I'm bigger than what this moment is. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're gonna be okay, you handsome to me. You're gonna grow into you. And she'll keep it real. She's like, so many people gonna fall off. Right. <laughs> right. You just a late bloomer. And right. I, you know, and I, I I love her to death for that for that. Have you run into some of your classmates that you that you grew up with? I mean, I don't know how often you get back home, but do you see any of them? Oh, that were on and popping then, and all of a sudden, it's not the same now? Oh, 100%. And, and they the biggest fans, and to be honest with you, I don't even hold no grudge to that. You know what I'm saying? We were all young. Kids. And honestly, I was one of those people, I couldn't wait to get out. Of, I couldn't wait to be done with school. Right. I was ready to do stand-up. I was ready to start going. Like, I was already planning my stand-up career probably when I was about 16. And I used to look like uh, Chicago sometimes, uh, the newspaper in Chicago, used to do a weekend magazine in there, and they had a list of the comedy clubs. So for, like, almost... Most of my life, I was looking at this list of comedy clubs. So I, when I, by the time I turned 18, I started writing them down like, okay, I'm going to show up here, show up here, show up there. Like a lot of those places, I wouldn't be old enough to get in. I would just get there really early. Damn, they had them set up. They probably thought I worked there just so I could sign the list and get some stage right. time. 
So from a very early age, you knew exactly what you wanted to do. You wanted to be a comedian. I knew exactly what I, this, this is like, I, so the moment I for real knew was in high school, I did a play and uh, my teacher let me write my lines. And I went to a hood high school, it's the West Side. They heckled everybody. Somebody came in there and did, I have a, I have a dream speech. They booed, they booed them. Oh my goodness. <laughs> How you booed Dr. King? They'll boo, they'll boo you. Like, take that little ass suit off, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, when I, the teacher let me write my lines, and so I wrote my jokes in this, you know, the script. And I remember my first big laugh I ever got from something I wrote was almost addictive. And this, once again, I told you, this, this is a tough crowd. It's right. an easy crowd to make a laugh. Right. And so I remember when we got to the play and they gave me like a period off. So I sat in the auditorium by myself, which is, this is a hundred percent a true story. I literally talked to God that day and said, God, I wanted, I was very specific. I wanted to stand up. I want to be an actor and I want to be a writer. And I sat there by myself. I said, I don't know how I'm going to do it. I know I don't know nobody, but this is what I'm going to do. And, um, man, I've been running at that since then. That's like, that's, I'm not even lying about that. I, I, <laughs> Sometimes I blow my bag and I'm like, oh, I really like pulled off something I had no connections to. Was that the first time when you wrote your lines and you did that special at school? Was that the first time that you knew you was funny and you could make people laugh and this was what you're going to do? Oh, I knew it. But this one made it cool. I remember like, because we did the play. It was a play. We did right. it for all the different classes, the freshmen, the sophomores, juniors, and seniors. I was okay. seeing at the time. And I was walking around school that week and everybody was treating me like I was Jamie Foxx. Like, I mean, it was kind of, it was one of the most, it was scary. It was almost like I got a chance to see whatever that felt like. Right. And you were addicted. I was like, well, I can do this. Right. What is, <laughs> what is it about Chicago? Because I'm looking at Bernie Mac, Michelle Obama, Jennifer Hudson, Kiki Palmer, Sherry Shepard, Jesse Williams, Chance the Rapper, Kanye Common, Harrison Ford, Robert Williams, Hugh Hefner, D. Wade, D. Rowe. <laughs> Man, what y'all got in the water now? Look, I don't understand Chicago is big, but I mean... Chicago, you get tough skin there. Okay. And so whatever you decide to do, you kind of, you can go to, I think if you can make it out of Chicago, you can make it anywhere. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And then even when you think about stand up comedy, you know, you think about the Bernie Max, you know, and I could name a gang of comedians, especially that influenced me from Chicago. You know, I remember even just being a new comic. When you came to Chicago, say a headliner came to Chicago. Okay. And I've seen everybody come to Chicago. Man, you really had to be funny because you had to go after all these local comics who would do just five to ten minutes and dick standing ovations. So you had to be a beast. So it's like it's certain comics, especially as a Chicago comic, that we all know that ran through there that we'd be like, yeah, we respect you. We respect you because we saw you do that. We saw like people like J.B. Smooth was like mm -hmm. a Chicago comics favorite, like. Like, even if none of us liked each other, right. we'd all be in that room to see J.B. Smooth. I don't care if it wasn't no audience in there. It'd be an audience full of Chicago comedians in tears laughing at J.B. Smooth and, like, Tony Roberts, you know what I'm saying? Uh, I mean, I remember when Cat came to Chicago. You know, D-Ray, D-Ray Davis, I don't know. Yeah, hey, I know D-Ray. D-Ray used to have a Sunday night in Chicago, Riddle's Comedy Club, which was the hottest spot. Like, it was just a hot spot. Mm -hmm. And man, like he brought in everybody. Cat came in that headline. We seen, we seen some of the Rudy Ray Moore, Dolomite, Dolomite did riddles. Now he, now he. That had to be that way, way. Let me tell you something. He dissed all of us. Like he went on stage because he was real old at the time. Yeah. And so you know, we all excited to see him. He's selling. He's still selling the movies and everything. He used to sell the movies still. He used yeah. to literally still sell the Dolomite movies in person. Wow. And so he goes on stage. He got his own theme music. Got the cape on. And he goes up there like, these ain't real comedians. They don't have their own goddamn music. You know, I'm like, okay. It's like, he just tore a hole in all of us for no reason at all. But <laughs> did, it change, did it change the way you look at it? No, it just made me laugh, you know, because you know, this thing about it, for me, the way I came up in the game, I feel like I was a fly on the wall for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so all I did was just observe how everybody moved and I listened. I've gotten advice from everybody you could think of. And I'm one of those people like, I, I keep like a clipboard in my head full of advice from everybody. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like that's why I've had success in this business because I've really listened to the advice, right. you know, and I got it from everybody. I mean, I told you I watched the show. So like you've had some of my OGs in here, like, you know, said entertainer mm -hmm. who I love to death because, you know, when I was trying to, I used to open for said too, I got toured with him. Um, but man, when I tell you, he gave out great advice. I, I remember I went to go do the Carmichael show and I've never done a sitcom before. And I came out here a couple of days early in LA 
And I called Sid. I'm like, Sid, I'm in town, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I'm a little nervous. He's like, well, oh, yeah, you never did a sitcom before. Well, come on the Soul Man set. So he had me come on the Soul Man set to watch how the rehearsals go. Right. So I'll be ready in a couple of days to go do Carmichael's show. And he prepared me with that. And I, I really appreciate He didn't have to do that. You know what I'm saying? And I remember being on set of Carmichael's show, Loretta Devine, like, why are you so comfortable? I'm like, man, you don't know. Two days ago, I was on the Soul Man set and I saw exactly how this is supposed to go. Yeah. So right. shout out to Sid and Ricky. I toured with Ricky. Uh, Open for I'm open for everybody. You know, I've worked for everybody. You know, even shit, even Cat. Like Cat, Cat gave me some advice to this day that I've kept with me, which is very interesting. It was weird when he gave it to me. We was at we was at the Improv. D Ray, he still do Monday nights at the Improv, and I got on stage at a great set. And some one of the cats and one of his homies said like, "Yo, Cat, want to you know say what's up to you." And I go say what's up to him, and he didn't really say hi enough. He just gave me this advice. That's all it was. I was like, oh man, what's up, man? I'm a big fan, you know, blah, blah, blah. He's like, don't let these niggas burn you out. I was like, what? Don't let these niggas burn you out. What did he mean by that? I don't know. <laughs> but I took that advice and and it only, it shows up in certain times, right? Mm -hmm. I think it shows up when my team wants me to do way more stuff and I'm tired. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Or somebody's pushing me too much. I'm like, no, nah, I gotta. I don't want to be burnt out. I gotta. I gotta have it together. I think like, you know, I look at somebody like. Well, you have to learn to say no. You gotta it, not even just no, or not right now. You gotta learn to pace yourself. It doesn't have to. You know that strike the iron wise hot mm -hmm. thing. I think is could be a little scary at times because that means you're just gonna do whatever. But like, if you take yourself and just pace yourself. Cause I look at somebody, Bernie Mac's a great example who we saw really, Bernie was working all the time. Yes. And, you know, sometimes he, you know, I think he might have a little fatigued cause he'll, he'll, he'll come to LA. He, you know, he didn't live in LA. Right. So Bernie would come here and film and then literally go back to Chicago, which is crazy. Right. You'll film here all week and then you fly back to Chicago just to be at your house. Like that's a lot. And so I, I just wanted to make sure Cat said that, but then Chris Rock kind of said the same thing when we talked before. And I've heard it from a bunch of veteran comics about pacing yourself and not burning you out, burning yourself out. But as a, <clears throat> excuse me, as a young comic coming up in the game, there's a fine line between getting out and doing enough sets so people see you, so you get that big break, mm -hmm. and and not like like Cass said, not burning yourself out. So where is that line? Well, in the beginning, it doesn't feel like a burnout. Because you grind it. You just need the stage. You just well, Correct. you get the stage at the stage time, man. That's what you would do. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, like, for instance, I told you about D-Ray had the Sunday spot. Right. When I first started, he, once again, that was the hottest club in Chicago. And I wanted to go up every week. And so he's like, yo, you want some stage time? You got to help seat. So I helped seat the people every Sunday, both shows, I was seating people. And I'm gonna be catching a lot of shit from comedians. Like, damn, how you gonna do that? That's not degrading, that's not da 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 I'm like, nah, cause I get a chance to go up on the hottest stage every single week in front of the biggest crowd every single week. Right. So I don't care how embarrassing it looks. Matter of fact, it gives me a cheat code. I know everybody that's in here. I know what this audience is gonna be. I know what their energy is, cause I seat it. Everybody in here. <laughs> and so, you know, it's one of those things where like, you know, I cared about the stage time earlier. It's just getting those reps up. And that was so important. But then it's like learning all different aspects of the game, which is why like, you know, I think it's very important. I, and I definitely, I'm not, I have to say this is like, everybody's journey is different. Nobody has the same journey, right? And which is why I, I don't like telling nobody else's story. <clears throat> You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Everybody's journey is different, which is why I think it's so beautiful about this time now in black comedy. You know, people don't realize that comedy is still kind of a new, it's kind of the newest, a newer entertainment than almost like hip hop is. And so we just really seeing our, our consistent millionaires of black comedians. Mm -hmm. This this is new. Like the deals that Kevin is getting, the stuff this cat has done, the stuff that Sid has done, the stuff that Ricky's done with the radio. This is just, this is consistently still almost first generation of all this type of success. Right. And it's a bunch of people at the same time. And so like, you know, I, I, I'm excited about like, we just have all these different <coughs> things happen. We have fucking hit radio hosts. We have cats who've been on several sitcoms. We have cats who, still touring arenas everywhere and selling out. We had this cat who's like, you know, you look at 
Kevin is selling underwear now. He got everything. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, you know, comics are selling shoes. Mike Epps is buying his neighborhood. Right. You know, Michael Blackson's going back to like it's so much happening. It's like, yo, like I, I hope sometimes that people could take time. I know it's competitive what we do, but take time to be like, yo, what yo, we doing this shit. You know, we have a Jamie Foxx who won an Oscar. Yeah. A black stand-up comic. And we think about mostly everybody came from Dev Jam and Comic View. True. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, our people made us stars and now everybody's crossed over. Yeah. That's crazy. I'm not who I'm who I am because of them. You don't have a Hannibal Burrs or a Gerard Carmichael without all these sacrifices, which is one of the things I I look at the camera. You tell me I look at all my OGs, I love y'all. I want y'all to realize all those things you went through saying from like, I'm talking about all the stuff, because I've been handling a lot of stuff since Club Shay Shay. Mm. Is look, I get people who've had you know, you've had things, encounters, and people ask you to do things that you didn't feel comfortable with. Your nose made it easier for me to walk in. Your nose. So when they was asking you to do stuff you didn't want to do and stuff like that, your nose helped me, helped Gerard, helped Hannibal, helped East. It helped so many people. Your nose. And look at it from that perspective. Don't think we all, because we're doing it now. That we we haven't even went. I haven't went through any of the stuff some of them have went through wow. because of their nose. Right. And you got to realize the business understood. Like, damn, we need we need the funny. So we can't even try them. We got to get them on their talent. Yeah. And so that's that's that's. I don't know. I have to say that. <laughs> Your um, Kanye's all for, also <clears throat> excuse me from Chicago. Mm -hmm. How motivation is it to see him local? become this global icon what he became let me tell you something that college dropout album i bought it with four other comedians and we drove around listening to it you know no matter what you know kanye <clears throat> said and done a lot of stuff since then that college dropout album for chicago for chicago like if you talk to other chicago people who's, you know you know stars or whatever we always like yo that was like that person we like yo he's a superstar mm -hmm. and he did it his way He's an underdog. And then like, especially for like the nerd group, the backpack group, you yeah. know what I'm saying? You know, wearing your sweaters and, yep. you know, with the, you know it, it was, man, it was life changing. I used to, one of my cars <clears throat> at that time, I used to say, I used to call myself the Kanye comedy. You know what I'm saying? Because I was so inspired by like, dude, he did it his way, his voice. He loved it so much that he like got in these rooms with Jay-Z. They had to show him love. Right. Like even when you watch the Yeezus documentary, the last dance and that documentary give me chill sometimes because I remember the moments. Like, I, you know, I, I, I watched Last Dance. You know where you were when you saw Man, it. And I know how it inspired me. And so I get goosebumps when I when I watch Yeezus and I, and I see Kanye when he paid for his first video, the, the, the Through the Wire video. And you see D-Ray in the video. You see Harold's Chicken in the video. You see, it's so Chicago. And it's number one on 106 in part. And it's the most localist video you could ever do, but around the world, it's the number one video. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so I was inspired by that. Like his rise, like I wouldn't be, like Chicago, we do have a, a sense of, how do I say it? It's not like cocky. <clears throat> it's like, we just really, we really confident. Chicago cats are like insanely confident. Mm -hmm. And that's because, you know, I told you I grew up in things I saw, so like, if I'm able to get out of all that, like, I'll be all right. That's why coming to L.A., I was coming here to dominate. Right. When I was hitting the stages here, I love when they used to put me up in the, the new face part of something. Because next time you got to put me on the show, I went too hard. So they're like, man, we got to put him on the regular show. He can't do the opener thing no more because he's he going too hard. So I used to come here with, like, I was coming here being a problem. Chicago made me feel like a star. And I did all the grinding. I had like shouts out to Mary Lindsay, who on Jokes in Those Comedy Club gave me a spot every single week that I could freestyle on stage and do new material and just bring and uh, develop my own audience and learn the business of comedy. Cause I had to learn how to hustle my own shows. Right. Cause nobody wanna go book me like this. So I had to book my own, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so like, man, I'm glad you brought Ye up. Man, you know, look, Kanye, Kanye's a lot. But in that beginning stage, I love Kanye for how he inspired us, man. So what about the latest rant? Where are you? <sighs> Cats 
said something I, I agree with, right? I, I don't understand how, if we say somebody talking crazy and this, like, we all got family members that talk hella crazy. Mm -hmm. Do we really pay attention to them? No. Do we take everything they say like, oh man, this is what we gonna take, no. Nah. But they don't have the platform that he has. But, but even though he has the platform, they're not as influential as he is. But is it really influencing anybody? You see how do you see what happened when he when they took Jesus off from Adidas? Yeah. So you tell me that influence. But, but here we go. They actually but they took it away from him and then they needed him again. Yeah. You you gotta understand stuff. This is a person who <clears throat> know who they are, they know their business, and they know what they had to offer. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so because of that, like as much as they like, we done Adidas, like we're done with him. And then you see months later, they're like, well, we gotta Sell the rest yeah, of the product. Yeah, we gotta give him this money anyway, cause cause we bought all the product. Yeah, so he know his business. Mm -hmm. I just think Ye, you know, I think Ye just talk better in music. Sometimes I think he just just makes songs like stop talking regular, just <laughs> make a phone. <laughs> he lost his mother. You lost your mother at a young age. Yeah. Do you think he hasn't healed from that because he was very very mm -hmm. close to his mom, and I don't know the relationship. So maybe you can correlate, maybe you can say, okay, well, this is the type of relationship that I had with my mom, and this is how I dealt with it. And so maybe we can have a better understanding of what Kanye is going through dealing with the tragedy and the sudden loss of his mom. I think, and it's funny you say that. So I'll go to therapy. Mm -hmm. And it took years for me to do that. And I didn't realize how much, my mom died at 09, but it was still affecting me this whole time. You know, it wasn't until I had like a panic attack on my stairs one day. And I've never had one before. I was on my way to set and I couldn't stop crying. And my assistant came in and she was like, you know, she could tell, you know, I was, and she'd been talking to me about going to therapy, mm -hmm. actually, which is interesting. I'm like, well, pull him up. Let me talk to somebody. And my first session was literally about how I really never mourned and got over my mother's death. And a lot of us go through that, you know, not just yay, you know, I, you know, and I hope she don't mind me even saying this with my good friend, Tiffany Haddish. One of my best friends, and we, you know, we talked about this. And some of us tend to go busy, right? We go busy. We we don't. That's how you deal with. That's it. how we deal with it. And it's, you're not dealing with it. You're not dealing with right. it. Right. And so for me, you know, when I, I you know, and my, she was just saying that she was just talking about how like she had to slow down and just deal with it. She thought her working. Yeah. Will help, and it does. All it does is make you more tired. First of all, yes. You physically outside of mentally and spiritually, you're just tired now. Mm -hmm. Cause now you're trying to make up for something that's, that you can't make up for. And so when I went to, you know, I had my first therapy session and we broke that down and I didn't realize how like, damn, I'm still like, oh, I was still like trying to, I didn't give myself space to mourn. Was it because you were like so busy in the comic and the thing and you're trying to, you're trying to grow your career that you didn't take time to mourn because you didn't feel like you had that because you say, I got to strike what I When we say career, right? I think it's career and I think it's blackness. Okay. I think it's black people. We've always been told to just get over it, move get on. Over, move on. Push through it. You got to push through it. Mm -hmm. And which is fine. You, right. you should push through things. But like, it's okay to be hurt by somebody you extremely love. Yes. Being gone. Mm -hmm. That that you love, that that's done. Like, I didn't realize that, you know, and once again, therapy opened up a lot of doors for me. I didn't realize that was something. I didn't realize all the other traumas, seeing, young, you know, young people, die. like all that stuff was a part of it. And, you know, when I look at Ye, and I remember telling somebody this a while ago, and I I remember watching a documentary and, and I had to pause it because I really got emotional because I, I started seeing his pain. Mm hmm. I could relate to it like, damn, that brother still hurting. And which is why you gotta be careful who you let into your life too, man. You know, especially as black people, our pain comes from so many different places. Right. Our personal pain along with like generational cultural pain. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have people who can recognize that around you, that that's a thing, that's a problem. And then when you're making all this money for people, they extremely don't care. Right. You know, and I think Ye still goes through that a lot of the times. You know, he's still like lashing out at people who really care about him. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because when you hurt, it doesn't matter. I mean, you take an animal that's hurt, you might be trying to help it. All it knows is hurt and it's going to lash out. 
even though you're trying to get it the attention that it needs to get better. Yeah. So those people, as you mentioned, because he's hurt and he's dealing with what he's dealing with, he doesn't understand the people that's in his life that's actually trying to help him. That's what's interesting. Like when you, you know, it's funny. The one thing we don't talk about, I, if I could be honest, <laughs> I think Kanye's on the spectrum. I was watching, once again, Jesus again, and the way his mom would talk to him. Mm-hmm. I have a, my youngest son, he's six, he has autism. It's a language, man. It's a way you have to talk. And I'm watching things she's saying, and I'm like, oh, wow. Which makes it even more fascinating to me that he was able to like, to even function and do all this, these great things. But I'm like, oh, he, that's why she was able to say certain things. You think about it, she's the only one who's been able to speak his language. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And I thought, I think that's fast. I was watching, they, they was walking through a field, I think on the south side near the old house. And, you know, and I think that's one of the things I, I, I hope, I don't know if Kanye talks to anybody. And I've always said this before, like, you know, sometimes you wish you could be friends with somebody. Yes. Kanye is one of them. It's people that's passed away. I wish I was friends with. I wish I was friends with Luther Vandross. I wish I was friends with Whitney Houston. You know, I wish I was friends with Richard Pryor. I wish I could have just talked to them, you know, especially, you know, like I bring up Luther because I, I was seeing an interview with Patty LaBelle and she was like, you know, as much as Luther never wanted to publicly say he was gay because he didn't want to, Patty LaBelle said he didn't want to disappoint his fans or his mother. And that's, that's wild to me. Right. And I wish, you know, you wish you had the friend to be like, man, do you brother? What's your gift got to do with there? Yo, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And you know, it's same thing with Whitney. It feel like these, a lot of these guys, especially in our business, were in so much pain. And you know, Kanye's one of those dudes. Let's think about it. I've ran into Kanye a, a million times. We've been around, like, we all Chicago, we all got the same friend. Right. <laughs> um, but it's like one of those things where like, if anybody ever could sit down and just have like, with nobody around conversation with, I would love to do that. Because I think I could still watch somebody dealing with that type of pain from his mom and he doesn't give it moments. I give it moments now. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, I remember I did my last special, I kicked everybody out the dressing room just so I could have a good cry. I shot it, I shot my last special at Chicago Theater and all this was based, you I mean, I told you, I told you she set me down one day, it's a, it's a thing I never forgot, she said my name was gonna be in light. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I did a Chicago theater and I, I remember before the show started, I stood outside across the street because we used to walk and go school, sh uh, sh clothes shopping and school supply shopping downtown Chicago and on Christmas go see it. But we always walk past Chicago theater and see the lights. So I see Lil Rail Howery live in lights. I stared at that thing for about an hour. And at one point, I remember when I was done with the show and it was standing ovation. And, you know, you're trying to close the show and you can go back and watch it. I, I get really, ch I get kind of choked up because I literally looked out there and I saw her standing there in the crowd. And so I'm like, I'm like, oh shit, I really <coughs> pulled this thing off. You pulled it off. You know, and even what's so funny, even at the end of that night, you know, the end of the show, I give praise to Bernie Mac. It felt like, I felt like I saw my mama. I felt like I saw Bernie. And I go backstage, and I'm one of the people, I don't have fanfare. It, it'd be, you know, most of the times it's me and my lady or whoever. And mm -hmm. I literally, I was in that green room just bawling. And you gotta give yourself space to do that. That's not sadness. Right. That's, that's me celebrating. That's me being human. And for a long time, especially as a black man, I felt like I had to be extra strong about everything like extra strong, mm -hmm. oh, I couldn't cry, oh, I couldn't do this, and I couldn't do that. And, you know, having sons now, that's the one thing I teach them, like, fam, it's okay. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I think it's strength in crying. That's one of the things I love about my fiance. She's let me, she doesn't make me feel like less of a man in my most vulnerable times. And I've had some, I have some crazy <laughs> moments. Well, I was like, yo, they gonna kick me, you know what I mean? And yeah. she's been there and she's seen me cry and I don't feel like less of a man. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Um, I read you had a more than a few run-ins with R. Kelly and they were all bad. <laughs> yeah. I mean, y'all from Chicago, come on, <laughs> Red Light. You, 
You just spent 30 minutes telling me how everybody from Chicago. Cause let me say this, the brother, let's, let's know, let's say this. Gar Kelly's gifted. We all know that. One of the most gifted R&B singers of all time. And singers, I, writers. And you got to be careful, R. Kelly, cause Chicago, I don't give a damn fan. Like, I literally just did a show in Chicago and I was talking about something. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if I even said R. Kelly name. I think I was talking about Jay Z. No, I was talking about uh, proposing to my uh, to my fiance at Jay Z Hill, and somebody got mad that I said Jay Z because it triggered them. Be like, well, forget Jay Z. He, he, you know, he played Rob. I'm like, yo, y'all still. And I had to say Chicago. Let me say this to y'all. If I ever get in trouble, y'all better have my damn back. You know what I mean? <laughs> like y'all have his. Man, because <laughs> no matter what. It, when you go to Chicago, they still play R. Kelly in the clubs and everything. And he's of my homeboys is DJ. Right. I, look, isn't R. Kelly? We just had some very awkward. He, he just, you know. So, so what? What made it awkward? What made? Look, he's from like you said. You've had run-ins with him. Yeah. You've had. I mean, obviously, you've seen him around. What made it so awkward? What is it about him? Now, maybe you knew what the public finally found out. Yeah. But what was it about him that rubbed you the wrong way? Okay, well, I, I don't even know where to start. Let's start at John Singleton's birthday party. Okay, you the John Singleton birthday party. Before he, you know. Think, Before he passed away. Yeah. And no VIP section. John Singleton, no. A gang, it's just famous people everywhere just having a good time mm -hmm. chilling. Guess who made themselves a the VIP, VIP section? He made... I don't know where he got a rope from. I'm not even making this shit up. It was this space maybe big as this. He found a space to make a section for himself, which I thought was weird first. Right, because it's not your party. Literally, it's not your party. Then he sends somebody over there, like, hey, real man, Robert want to say what's up to you. I'm like, well, he can come over here. We all chilling. Ah, oh, come on, Ray. No, no. <laughs> I'm not gonna say it. I'm not, I'm not gonna like, because it was such an open, it wasn't like that. Right. It literally wasn't like that. So in other words, he wanted you to leave your spot and come to where Damn, he was. Just do what everybody else doing. Was just mingle. Just walk Dude, around. John Single had, Singleton had such good energy. Everybody was just chilling, man. It wasn't like that. And he did that. And so you said no. I said, no, I'm good. Okay, that kind of rub, that probably caused you. 100% rubbed the wrong way. But I don't, at that point, I ain't care. Now, my first run-in, which maybe started all this, was I did stand-in work for Trap in the Closet. Okay. Okay, you remember the trap? Yeah, I do. My, my friend Cassidy read that. Uh, Kenyatta Mucci. Oh, man. Special lady. Gave me and my brother a job. My brother. So this is like the first few chapters. So I was a stand-in for the cop, Michael K. Williams. Okay. And my brother was a stand-in for the little guy. Even though my, my brother was way taller than him, so he had to, like, stand on his knees to be Because I don't know why. They, but that's, that's what it was. Yeah. One of the other stand-ins was one of his background dancers. And we all became, all the stand-ins hung out with each other, man. You know, we mm -hmm. get, became friends and we was talking. I mean, I was laughing, having a good time. And I remember him looking at us, talking to her, right? He was just looking, okay? He was just looking. He was looking at his, you know, you in your little chair. And he's just like, I'm like, I ain't pay. I ain't whatever. That ain't no big deal. The next day we on set, okay? I go to speak to the young lady. She's not talking to me. She don't even speak back. Ah. Uh. Right? I'm not making this up. Yeah, I ain't, I don't have no reason to lie. <laughs> and so I'm like, man, why she not talking to us? I said, my brother, like, yo, why? She ain't talking to us no more, right? The next day he had every, I'm not even lying about this. He had every woman on that set near his chair. And they're like literally all the guys who was all literally <laughs> standing next to each other. And I remember pulling her to the side and I'm like, yo, what's up, man? Did I say something wrong? Did I do anything? She's like, no, Robert said I can't. I can't talk to you. I said, for wh why? What'd I do? And that was it. And I thought that was so weird. And so that set would be for years. And then like he acted really crazy, that funny actor at the comedy. Did you ever address it? To him? Yeah. At that time, I was just a stand-in. No, but I'm saying, and later, we, I'm sure you, you've seen him, you had seen him since then. No, I'm one of those people, like I, <laughs> I'll keep something in my head. Right. I'll, I'll just be like, yeah, that's, See, you on my list, R. Kelly. Mm -hmm. You don't know I'm beefing with you. Right. But I'm beefing with you. <laughs> but I just never forgot that. And then, like, he came to a comedy show one time. And I went to speak to him. I tried to give grace again. And, and he's like, do I know you? You know. Oh, uh, like, come on, man. He hit you with that. Yeah, man. Was this before or after the John Singleton birthday party? It's before that. 
So by the time we get to that, and I'm like, I'm in LA now, I'm invited to stuff, I'm, you know, I'm doing mm -hmm. my thing. I definitely don't care about talking to you. I don't, like, that's why it was so funny. By the time this boy's like, oh, Rob, man, he's a fan, you wanna say what's up? I'm good. Tell him I say what's up. Yeah, I'm over here, bro. <laughs> so how you feel? Do you feel he finally got his comeuppance? You know, that's a, I don't know, man. It's, it's one of those tough things, because, like, I feel bad for anybody that went through anything that, that R. Kelly put them through. The victim, you feel bad for the victim, not him. But then also, I kind of feel bad for him a little bit, too, because I think, so. once again, I'm, I'm talking to you about Ye, and I'm talking to you about, I just want black men to, to go to therapy. Mm -hmm. I feel like that brother has some things happen to him that's like, that he's never addressed. A lot of times, people who do all these very abusive things like that have some crazy things happen to them mm -hmm. that they've never addressed. And I feel like he's he's one of them. But then it is this weird thing where everybody think they could just do stuff and get away with it. It's such a weird mindset to me. Like, how do you think you can do all this crazy shit and never get caught up in it? Mm. Let me ask you a question. Who's your rappers on Mount Rushmore? You got Kanye, Common, Lupe, Lupe Fiasco, Twister, The Brat, Chance the Rapper, Juice World, Lil Durk, Chief Keith. Come on, Chicago? Yeah, yeah, Chicago. Okay. That's easy. Um, Twister, Do or Die. I know they're a group, but. You know, Crucial Conflict, Kanye West, Common, Chance. I don't know if you went to school, but you do know where, like, my Rushmore only got four heads. Well, I know, but I'm not, you're not for the, if I, I can't do a Ralph, I'll get my ass. I just said, I'd say Mount Rushmore. I'm not doing no Mount Rushmore. I could have swore I said, oh, I'm who doing, I'm going to do Congress. <laughs> yeah, well, damn, you about to put a hundred. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to, you about to put a hundred people on Mount. I'm going to do the council. That's okay, what, okay. <laughs> I can't do no Mount Rushmore. Okay, how about give me your top five? Of Chicago. Chicago. Damn. Common. De DeBrat. And it's the tough one comment on that list because, you know, he broke my own girl heart. You know? Who? Tiffany. <laughs> Tiffany Haddish is my best friend. Yeah, but, I mean, Common had a lot of girlfriends. I'm sure a lot of people think he broke their heart. I know you don't know them like you know Tiffany. I know a couple of them, actually. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, he broke her heart, man. It was... But I'm sure at some point in time, she probably broke somebody's heart, too. Real? No, nah, it's, it's them light-skinned Southside niggas. Oh, Lord, I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> Well, you better tell us you better get with a dark skin, bro. <laughs> they just move how they move. But I still love them as an MC. So. Yeah. Yay, comment, DeBrad, Twister, Chance. Okay. That's a nice list. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. When you hear like Chicago violence, every time, every politician, the first thing they holler, what about Chicago? Hmm. It's interesting because <laughs> as a stand up comic, right? I tour everywhere. I tour all over the country, and it's a lot of places like Chicago. Mm hmm. You know, I just think none of these politicians will ever own up to how they just, you know, what they create in all the inner cities. I'm talking about from Chicago to Baltimore, uh, D.C. It's fam. Yeah, for sure. Memphis. <laughs> like, what are y'all talking about? It's all is what it is. So, you know, um, it's it's Chicago's Chicago's interested with that. It's just. I guess I just think it's deeper than what we, you know, we like to do this and this and that. And it's just, I don't know if that's fair, man, until we start cleaning up, you know, all the shit that goes on in our communities. And it, nobody, nobody won't own that. They love to just point to, like, you know, when Barack became pregnant, yeah. they couldn't wait to, oh, did that. come on, fam. You know, that, I don't think that's fair. Um, and honestly, I, we didn't have social media then. I think the 90s was worse. Oh, for sure. For the violence? Man, it was crazy. Like, it was like, you know, that's when drive-bys was happening. That's when, like, people would tell you go home for real because they about to, you know what I mean? It was about to go down for real. It mm -hmm. wasn't like, stuff is a little more looser now, but back then, it was way more organized. You know, it was a bunch of gangs. You know, I went to high school. I, one year in high school was one of the scariest years of, my, of, my, of high school. They had closed a school that was down the street from us. So then all the gangs, literally, they put all those students in one school. So all... It, after every bell rang, it was just fights everywhere. It looked like lean on me. It was fucking crazy. Wow. 
It was really crazy. That was a cra- I'd never seen nothing like that before. Are you a Bulls fan? You, as, uh, as a Chicago sports fan, <laughs> are you a bigger Bulls, Cubs, Bears? Damn, that's a tough one. Uh, me and my brother were just talking about, we were talking about what stresses us out the most, which team. Because, <laughs> you know, we big Bulls fans. Mm-hmm. That's how I was yelling at the TV as usual. Um, I might be a bigger Bulls fan, but it depends. I don't know. Like, it's easy to be a Bears fan and be hurt because it's only 16 games. Right. So I can get over it. It's not a, it's not months. The NBA is from October to like June. So right. It's a lot of hurt. <laughs> and, and you know, baseball goes over. Oh my forever. God. And then, you know, especially when your team, like the Cubs made a run last year and then, you know, fell short and that. Right. So I'm a, I'm a, I am a Chicago sports fan. You talking about a person when the Cubs won the World Series. Oh man. I flew back to Chicago for that. Watched it in a club. I ain't never hugged so many grown ass men in my life with tears in my eyes. Full blown, we was all so ha- that was such a crazy game. You remember it was a rain delay? Yes. It yes, was so yes, stressful. Yes. But when I tell you that was the most peaceful Chicago has ever been, is when the Cubs won the World Series. I'm talking about black people. All of us was hugging in the street. It was everybody was outside, no violence. Just happiness. Well, you had it great in the 80s and 90s with the Bulls. Oh, my God. The Bulls at that, uh, you know, I, I told you the last dance, I watch it. It's like a bedtime story to me. I'll watch, and I can skip through now. I don't have to watch it order. Right. <laughs> so, so, what? I mean, did you, get, did you get an opportunity to go to any Bulls games when Jordan played? No, I didn't, but I am a crazy Bulls fan. I mean, one game last year, the Lakers played the Bulls. Mm-hmm. You were sitting across from me. Okay. I didn't want to say nothing to you because I was focused. That was a Sunday game. That was a Sunday game. Me and my cousin, Rashid, we had on our Bulls gear, and we was talking hellish. I done a movie with LeBron James. He yeah, you didn't speak to me. Come he on. didn't speak to me that day. He shouldn't. <laughs> he I was talking so much shit. He didn't say nothing to me. Mm-hmm. He acted like I wasn't sitting there. Of course I. Mm-mm. You wasn't sitting there. <laughs> you probably had the Bulls gear on, too. I had everything off. So... Okay. <laughs> Chicago native, Jordan, 80s and 90s. You was in a movie with LeBron, Space Jam 2. Mm-hmm. Who's the GOAT? Michael Jordan. You biased. Well, I got to... <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny? I'll say this, though. If we are going to go a couple more seasons, I'm, I will may have to switch that up because it's something interesting about watching LeBron. I think I'm more impressed by his older years mm-hmm. than I am these younger years, to be quite honest with you. Like the stuff he's doing yeah. at 39 is, yeah. is. He's not supposed to be playing at this level. Like I feel like him and Serena Williams, to me, are my two favorite athletes of all time. Mm-hmm. Like who was still, who's still able, like, you know, when, when we watched Serena make that last one, she was still like. Like that's what she won the U.S. Open and she was pregnant. That's crazy. That's like them two, the two superhumans outside of Bo Jackson, right? Yeah. You know, I wish we could have saw Bo, Bo, but Bo was like the first superhuman right. mm-hmm. to me. You know what I mean? But like other than that, LeBron and Serena, they're like superheroes to me. <laughs> you were in Uncle Drew with, <clears throat> with Shaq and Kyrie. What was that experience like? Oh man, that was that was so much fun, and it was it was also because I'm a sports fan. You mm-hmm. know, I remember like telling the story and this became a thing because I told the story when I went to the Oscars and I know it's going to be a thing but I was like you know when, oh you talking about you were at the Oscars when Chris but... well I went to the Oscars and I somebody asked me about Uncle Drew and I had to talk about something mm-hmm. it, went, it went it made it to sports center which I thought was weird. yes and so it was because I was the, so I, you see I'm a basket you see I'm a fan yes I watch every day I told yeah. you I watch first take every morning yeah. that means I watch sports center yeah. like oh that so we about to do our first me and Kyrie about to do our first little read together right I'm watching sports center and I'm like Kyrie wants to leave Cleveland, and I'm like, what? And so we get <laughs> our first read is just quiet. I'm just like, uh, before we go through these lines, can I ask you something? <laughs> is that true? Yeah. Did you? And then you know that's why I said I was a fly on the wall. Right. I heard some amazing stories that I would take to the grave with me as a sports fan. Right. And it was one of the greatest environments of all time. And we played real basketball. It, it's a, if you watch the movie, it's a scene where Lisa Leslie gets hot. Mm-hmm. She really hit 6'3 straight. Wow. 
the dunk, the one dunk Chris Webber does. Chris Webber does a dunk, because they all start playing for real, so he got hyped and forgot about his knees. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Chris Webber dunked the ball and literally ran off set and went home. Because he could, they brought the stand in because his knees were shot. He, shot. <laughs> he literally ran. He went to the trailer, took everything off. That was it. His knees was gone. <laughs> he was so hype, he dunked it for real. It was like, he kept going. <laughs> Get in on the action with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. New customers who deposit $5 or more can get no sweat bet up to $1,000 back in bonus bets. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code SHANNON. New customers can get a no sweat bet up to $1,000 if your first bet loses. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code SHANNON. The crown is yours. (laughs) So what was it like you got started in the comedy? So what year did you get started in the comedy game? Damn, uh, 99, 2000. 99, 2000. Mm-hmm. So how was your first time on stage? You don't even remember the first time. I don't even know if I did good. I just know I went on stage mm-hmm. with my jokes. So I felt very happy. And uh, But then, you know, I, I was okay starting out. That first year, was trying to fi- you're trying to figure out your voice, you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying, which is it's so interesting because, you know, the, another subject because of your 34 million viewed club shit. <laughs> <laughs> Is, you know, people talk about joke uh, stealing and all right. that other stuff. And the weird part is most comics, I think, in the beginning, you're doing probably other people's stuff you don't know you're doing. Right. If you watch Comic View every day in Dev Jam, you're probably doing whatever you thought was your original thought. And it's not until somebody tell you it's not. You know what I'm saying? Until you find your voice. You know. So you just stole somebody's joke? Oh, yeah. I, I, and I didn't even mean to do it. Damon Williams, I tell the story all the time. Damon Williams is Chicago Godfather comedy. Mm-hmm. And I, he had an all good joke he did on comedy. <clears view. throat> and I didn't realize I watched it so many times. I thought I wrote a, an original joke and it wasn't my joke. And I did the joke at the hit spot, got booed off stage. Because they had heard it, oh, heard him man, do it. They had heard him doing it. I had no face here at the time. I was cursing. So people like, who that little boy up there cursing? It was just, it was, it was hell. They played the DJ, which is my friend to this day, DJ Dollar Bill, he's my friend, played someone, please call 911. That's how I got up. <laughs> <laughs> your, your, your boy. <laughs> he was my boy. At that time, we didn't know each other. Right. But that's how hard I was eating it. And Damon was on the side of the stage. Damon tore. This is so funny. Damon roasted me, killed me. You know, I did his joke, so he hit me with that. And I'm like 19 at the time. Right. <laughs> So I'm waiting on my ride. Right. <laughs> he up his rain outside. Everybody's gone. Damon, he's still there. He sees me outside in the rain. I got my little book bag. <laughs> he's like, hey, man, get in the car. I was like, no, I'm good, right? Because <laughs> I'm still mad about him roasting me. Right. He's like, man, get in the car. And I felt like it was so funny because I felt like he felt like he had to encourage me. Right. Because I was in the car. Right. He's like, yeah, man, you know, just uh, just keep on, you know, just keep trying, man. You know, just gotta, you know, I'm like, man, you ain't gotta say shit to me. Yeah, you already said enough. <laughs> you already said enough back to earlier. But I, but I, you know, that's, yeah. We, I think we all bum and, and try stuff, but you have to find your voice. And once you figure that out, you know, you get the glow. That's when you just, you make it run. So did you freestyle or did you write it down? I, I wrote down a lot of stuff in the beginning, but like, now, like when I started hosting a room every week, which I always suggest to all comedians, right. like host, host. I know a lot of comics don't like the host, but it gives you that you get a muscle about uh, just freestyling. Right. You know what I mean? Like I, I heard Cat when he was on here, talking, you know, talking about how you know how people develop specials and you got to do this and do that. Right. So like you sharpen the joke, you tell. But I don't a joke. know. Everybody has to do that. Like Sinbad is somebody that could just go on stage. Sinbad doesn't have to write anything. Sinbad. Some of those specials, most of them, are Sinbad freestyling. Wow. Just going. My last special because I was shooting all these movies at the same time. I didn't have time to tour. So whatever I did that night is what I did. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So like, but it, but you only develop a muscle like that from doing it for so long. Right. You trust your voice and your comedy and your timing. Right. You know, I can go up tonight and do an hour and I don't know what the hell I'm gonna talk about. So you're shooting movies mm-hmm. and because you don't have time to really write, you're freestyling. You say you're gonna go up on stage, you, would, you could go up on stage and have no idea and it would just come back because you've done it for so long. I lied to HBO and told them I wrote and practiced the set and I didn't do shit. <laughs> <laughs> so we like, that's why they like, it's so funny. Everybody came backstage tonight. They're like, man, that was great. I was like, 
And I had I flew in a couple of my homies, uh, Rito Brown, Jay Alexander, right. like, tour with me. But they what they did with the first show became the like a blueprint for what I was gonna do for basically the special. So the second show is mostly the special, right? Because that's where it was more tight. But that mm -hmm. first show, I was just having fun, right? I was just winging it. And then the second show, I kind of had a better idea on where I would go with things. But that first show was just me winging it. So. Are you one of those guys where you roast the audience or do you just let, I mean, you just like, come on guys, hey, I'm here to do my thing. I got the skills. I will roast the shit out of you if you heckle me. But this is a crazy thing about it. If you're good enough as a comic, I'm for real about this. A heckler wouldn't even have time to do, you're hitting them too hard. Mm -hmm. Even if they want to heckle you, you still, you're thinking too fast. Like, and that's the one thing, the greatest thing about being a good roaster, and I'm talking about like, I've done colleges, and college is the toughest stand-up comics. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Because if you don't roast, like, you got to know how to roast. And I was like 21, 22. So when I was doing these colleges, mm -hmm. it was my age group. It's cool. It's, it's people to this day walk up to me like, hey, man, uh, my next three years of my college life was fucked up because you roasted me. I'm like, well, you was heckling. Right. That's why you play. They, they literally talked about this man for three years straight based off that comedy show. But you shouldn't have yelled out shit. Right. You mentioned early on in your career, D. Ray Davis gave you an opportunity for a five minute set. So you had to set up, set up the club. What did that opportunity mean to you? It meant everything to me. I, I look at every opportunity like that. You know, like D. Ray gave me that opportunity. Dion Cole gave me hella opportunity. Sid let me tour with him. Ricky Smiley let me tour with him. Um, and Ricky's funny too, because Ricky, <laughs> the way me and Ricky met so weird because i couldn't wait to meet ricky smiley mm -hmm. and my homeboy booked the show in chicago and they booked ricky and ricky brings his own show but i didn't know that oh uh, you know and so they my boys booked me on the show to open right matter of fact no i was supposed to host and ricky's like no i'm hosting the show dog you know how ricky talk right. and they was like well real has to be on the show he's like well i don't know who he is you know he didn't know who i was at right. the time and then ricky called damon and damon told you know that's what ricky said he called damon damon said i was funny but then he was still like, I don't know him, dog. You know, well, I'm going to put him up then. So Ricky put me up on stage and sat right in the front to watch my set. You know, and this these Chicago promoters, so they right. told him, Ricky was talking all that shit, but they was like, nigga, he on the show, we going to whoop your ass. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, he's like, all right, well, I'm going to put him up then, dog. And he put me up and I like, Man, I went crazy on that shit. And right after that, Ricky came backstage. That's why I love Ricky Smiley. He said, look here, dog. I didn't know who you was, dog, but damn it, I'm going to call you, dog. I'm going to call you. And how long were you, how long, do you remember how long you said it was? Probably like 15 minutes. And you know, this was like, that was one of the, at that time in Chicago, I was like, I was on one. Like, you know, like that was one of my biggest things. I, I got, Jamie Foxx used to do a festival called Jamie Foxx Laugh of Palooza in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And one of the panels I was I wouldn't watch was was old manager Marcus King, and which he gave great advice. I remember sitting there with a notebook. He said, "The best thing you could ever do is learn to run your city first, be the man in your city first, then venture out." And that that's what I decided to do. I I worked my ass off, become the man in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And because I that happened and I had that type of buzz and all that shit going on, when I showed up to LA and New York and all those places, I was fucking crazy confident. So I used to come out here, people are like, why this motherfucker so confident? He just so I'm like, cause I already felt like a star. Right. Chicago made done. me feel like a star already. Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, what's up? Now I'm finna show y'all who I am. Yeah. The facial expressions. How long does it take you to master a facial expression? You know what's funny? You have to master the people that's good at it first. So you know who's one of the greatest facial expression people to learn from? It's David Allen Greer. Yes. He does a weird point. He can make his lip shape. You know, it's just a very, like, and that's like, I told you I'm a student. So watching right. The Living Color, mm -hmm. watching some of, like some of the best guest spots I've ever seen on television was watching Martin and David Allen Greer playing that pastor. Mm -hmm. So funny, right? And but it's his facial expression. If he did Mr. McAfee, if he did CT and Reese's, it's right. his, it's even dialect. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And so Martin too, another one. Like you could tell when Martin was irritated, right? right. Which I think all of us started, you know, taking that for Martin, watching right. Kenan and Kale. Right. Dude, like so, you know, I'm I'm a student. Those facial JB Smooth, uh, the king of milking a joke and facial expressions is, is yeah. Do you find yourself doing any of these randomly? hundred <laughs> percent. My kids, you know, this is funny about having kids, right? It's not, you know, the oldest two are teenagers. 
they be making fun of me. They know when I'm irritated. Mm -hmm. They and they think it's funny, right? We'll be at a restaurant and like, you know, somebody say some stupid shit for me. I, I some face I'm making. I'm like, and they like, oh, dad is irritated. And they just be cracking up. Like they really be picking on me. Right. Actually. Uh, so I do it all the time, and I don't know. I'm not knowing it. Not knowing But I think that's what makes, that's what helps in, like, the movies and all that stuff. How long did it take for you to get your big break? When did you When did you know, say, you know what? Lorel is right. I think you get a couple of them. Okay. <laughs> the first one that I felt strong about was my second year doing Comic View. I did it in Miami. Arne S.J. was hosting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know Arne S.J. I remember a comic backstage. I, you know, I don't do the name thing. That ain't my thing. And a comic went up before me, killed, right? He's like, all right, good luck, little real. <laughs> like laughing at me like I was going to bomb. First bit I do, I used to do this remix of this tweet song, mm -hmm. Oops, Oh My, Standing Ovation. And then people don't realize that I used to like to do my best joke first. That's how you write really great jokes. Do, the, do your hottest bit first. And now I got to figure out how to follow this. Okay. So everything else got to be strong. Too. Okay. So I got to be able to do, I should have a bit that, I should have any bit that can close any show. Right. You know, any of my bits should be able to close my show. Right. And I thought, you know, that was something I learned early on. Stand ovation, got a stand ovation left. I had my little, my little real jersey on. Cause mm -hmm. you know what, you don't want people to remember you. So you, everybody yeah. used to put their name on their stuff. Right. <laughs> I got that from D Ray actually. Right. And you know, and so that happened. And then we move on to Bill Bellamy's Who Got Jokes. On TV One, that's what me and Tiffany Haddish became friends. Mm -hmm. I beat Leon Rogers, who's one of our most well-respected comedians out of Chicago, big radio personality out there. And I beat him in an episode of Who Got Jokes. And that was a monumental for me. That's when I was like, oh, shit. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm becoming a man. And then Martin Lawrence, First Amendment. Right. I do that. And... Standing ovation. Cheryl Underwood brings me back on stage. They edited this out, which I hate they did, but brought me back on stage and said, Chicago, this is your next Bernie Mac. I, every time I see Cheryl, now, because now I go sit on the couch at, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the talk, mm -hmm. and we hug, hug it out every time. I love her to death for that. I'm like, dang, I was just a kid. You, you did that. That was dope. Right. And so it's just different big breaks, but Get Out became my big screen yes. big break. And yes. that changed. That was the last movie I auditioned for. So every movie you see me in after that, it was just... It was they call it, they offer, wrote the riff for you. Offer only, yep. Watch. So was Comic View your first paid TV spot? Yep. BET's Comic View. I did it just so crazy. I did it in New Orleans before Katrina. Mm -hmm. It was like right before Katrina. It's almost sometimes I feel eerie about watching that tape. Because mm -hmm. New Orleans was a a different New Orleans before Katrina. And I just remember the energy. Even when you look, when you look at the audience, that, that audience is one of the best comedy crowds. Yeah, for sure. In the world was that New Orleans crowd. And it's so, it's kind of, it's eerie to watch sometimes. But yeah, I did, that comedy was my first, yeah, first paid year. I'm looking at in 2000, all the, you're like, NBC's last comic standing, P. Diddy, Bad Boys of Comedy, Russell Simmons Presents, Stand Up, L. Ray, uh, Shaq, uh, Shaquille O'Neal, the All-Star Comedy Jam. I mean, you were all over the place in the 2000s. I didn't stop. I feel like I needed a credit every year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I try to stay on TV every single year. So okay. whatever stand-up series was coming on, I'm like, oh, I got to get on this. You don't feel that you're too big for that now, that you've outgrown that? Yeah, I, I think so. I think for me, the next move is to create a show like that. Okay. You know, I need to host and produce something like that. Right. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That's been my goal the last few years. It was something bubbling, and then it... Ugh, you know, uh, fizzed away, but it's still something I, something I want to do is host and create something like that. Because that, those platforms really help me get to to where I'm at, which is why, like, you know, I, 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 I've been, your sh once again, your show has kicked off. Outside that interview, so many comics, it's so many conversations yeah. happening. And, you know, one of the things that people don't realize, once again, I was telling you earlier that everybody's journey is different. Correct. You know, mm -hmm. I did hear Kat say, like, you know, he was talking about Kevin Hart. Like, well, Kevin Hart, how many people, you know, come to L.A. with a movie and a sitcom and this and that? Well, unfortunately, I was watching it. I'm like, dang, Kat never, he don't know, he don't know about the festival circuit. He, oh, he don't, he don't know. Jesus Christ. You know how Kevin gets deals like that? You go to the Just for Last Festival in Montreal, which is one of the biggest comedy festivals in the world. 
You know what happens at the Montreal Comedy Festival? You go up on stage, have a great five to 10 minutes, and the next day you're meeting with studio execs that are actually there. They were giving people deals at these festivals. That festival helped change my life. They still do that? Still do it. Still, It's still the biggest. Like a lot of us go now and get awards from it now. I got an award as a uh, breakout comedy star a couple years ago. And I remember my speech, it was, I tear, teared up giving my speech. You know why? Because I sat in the back of that room 10 years ago as a new face comic. It was like, one day I'm going to be up there to get an award. And I, I got my award and I stood, I literally, it was packed in there. And I looked, I said, I told the comics, I had a little speech in there. And I said, let me get the speech. I sat in that last seat back there. That last seat back there and watched these that award show and spoke that up that I was going to be up there getting this one day. You know, I, I'll say this once again, you don't know everybody's journey like that. Right. You don't. And I think people got to be okay with not understanding different parts of the game. Like, brother, the festival, a lot of people got, it was a time, the early 2000s, mm -hmm. man, they was giving out deals at the HBO Aspen Festival and the Just For Last Festival. They was giving cats like $500,000 and having like, like, like just money. I think Cat might have been one of the people that got one of those deals at one point. Whatever opportunities you get, that's on you what you do with it. Right. You can't judge nobody else how they took, how they took the ball right. and ran with it. Right. Yeah. So that's how I, I had to say that. Kevin Hart produced your, uh, he actually executive produced your first solo stand up mission. Yep. How did you become cool with K Hart? Through Naeem Lynn is how we, we really pretty much met. Naeem Lynn is one of the cats that tour with him, one of the Classic Cup boys. Uh, Naeem couldn't do a show. I think it was in Chicago somewhere. Mm -hmm. And he told Kev, like, you should have real open up. And that's that's how that happened. Naeem was doing something else, suggested me, and that's how me and Kev met. And you, because uh, you had asked, uh, said to also because you're very, you're very cool with said. I wanted, so... On my list, I didn't even have Kevin on the list. We we had at that time we had the same agent, um, and he suggested Kevin, but I wanted either Sid or Russell Peters. Okay. Uh, which you know, a lot of people don't talk about Russell Peters. Russell Peters is one of the most giving comedians mm -hmm. of all time, like like literally giving. Like he's man. I, I don't know anybody. I, most of us have stories about him just looking out for us mm -hmm. and not asking for anything back. Man, like he's he. And, and once again, a lot of the cats are like that, you know, right. Chris Spencer, all these different, there's so many different people that's, that sold into my career right. that I, I, man, I'm very appreciative of them. You were in fatherhood with Kevin. Yeah. So you guys have become close because now he puts you in some of his films. Well, I, fatherhood is interesting because I think I got that because somebody else got in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and because it, it was very last minute, right. you know, I was shooting something else at the time, and I really didn't want to do anything. I wanted to take a break, and you know, they kept calling, and I was like, I asked for a crazy number, <laughs> like, would they give us this? Now I do. It. I'm like, oh, they say yes, and I was like, all right, I do it. Um, but yeah, it was really, that was kind of last minute, but it was fun to do with Kevin. That was, Fatherhood was actually that's actually a really good film. Yeah. I think that's one of Kevin's best films, actually. Right. Yeah. Who's your top five comedians today? Right now, as we sit there on this couch, Ooh. who's Lil Rail's top five comedian? Mm, damn, that's a good question. You know what's funny? They sent kind of the questions, but I thought it was going to be of all time. You, you today, damn. Today. That, that's a tough one. Mm -mm. Ooh. So that just means actively doing stand up right now. Right now. Wanda Sykes. That's my one. girl. I love Wanda. And we just, I'm just saying stand up right now. Who I think is, is putting it, putting man, you ain't got to give all this okay, information. We'll go ahead and say it now. Okay. Wanda trying to Sykes, hedge. Wanda Sykes, Earthquake, no. Ali Sadiq. Okay. Hmm. You got two more spots. I know. Damn. Choose wisely. I know who people want me to say. I, I, don't want, I don't want you to say nothing. I just want to want you to know that millions and millions of people are going to watch this. I, I know people will get mad at this. Gerard Carmichael. Okay. Real? Oh, man. I mean, look, you know, I remember, and I got, you know, I got honorable mentions like Deion Cole and different people like that, but like, 
you know, somebody recently put out one of these lists of who's the whatever. We everybody's trying to figure out what the criteria is, right? Right. I, and I've purposely done things. I've purposely done the amount of specials I've done. I've purposely done all the movies and television shows and all this stuff. And I'm like, don't consistency count? Of course. But it's like, if you're not a part of the hype machine of things, mm -hmm. you're never really in a conversation. We still got people who still want to be a part of these lists too much. I think it's <laughs> a graduating list. The reason why I don't mention Chappelle, the reason why I don't mention Chris Rock, I do believe people graduate. I think Sid graduated. I think, you know, Chris graduated, Dave graduated from, from being on a list. Uh, Kevin has graduated from being on a list. Like, y'all, y'all kings and OGs. I don't right. need to be on these lists no more. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. And so, yeah, that's, that's, that's my list. I think Wanda Sykes to me is the most underrated legend. I like Wanda. She's, she's fucking brilliant. I like some more. I like Adele Gibbons. I love all of them. Yeah. But we talking about like sure. right now. And it, but this is just my, this is yeah. my opinion. Yeah, of course. I'm asking you. Yeah. Okay. Well, give me your five greatest comedians of all time. That's easy. And I was thinking about this earlier because Richard is who we all put as number one, but I don't know if we, I think he's the, almost like the creator of the style, mm -hmm. of what we are. So mm -hmm. I don't know if we put Richard on there, but we just know Richard is. Yeah, Richard. Richard yeah. I, I don't know how you have a list if he's not on it. Yeah. But, but he don't have to be neither. He no, just, you can't. He's just the guy. Well, how you have a list? <clears throat> he's like, he's a comedy guy. Yes. But I'm saying, how do you have a Let list and Michael Jordan ain't on, on the list? You're right. You're right. Okay. All time. You, you asked me that. So Richard Pryor, Eddie Murphy, Moms Mabley, Bernie Mac, Robin Harris. Okay. That's my top five. And Eddie's to me, he's the, you know, that's, that's, that's who I've emulated my, the way I do stand up, telling stories, acting out characters, all that stuff is based off, uh, watching Eddie Murphy, listening to every Eddie Murphy album. How many times do you watch Raw? Oh. I've seen Raw a million times, but I watched Delirious, Delirious way more times. Matter of fact, it's an album he has. I bought a Best of Eddie Murphy cassette tape that I ended up downloading recently, but I bought the tape. I had the tape for years. And the joke he does about getting hit by a car <laughs> is to this day one of the funniest bits of all time. Right. Yeah. You did a, a bit with Chappelle. What makes Chappelle so great? You know what makes Chappelle so great? It's his honesty. You know, I like the fact that Chappelle decided he didn't want to focus on anything else but stand up. Mm -hmm. It's almost like he didn't want that other part of his career no more because he wanted people just to look at a stand up. Right. Uh, this last Chappelle special is, is, I think, is amazing. I really enjoyed it. It's unbelievable. It's really funny. And I know people are still, you know, people are upset about whatever, right. whatever. But it's so interesting. I think this is his silliest special I've seen in a while. And I love that, actually, because I, I do think sometimes we get too serious in comedy mm -hmm. and it's, it feels like a TED talk. But this one was just funny and silly. And I loved it. <laughs> his SNL special was that might be top 10. That one, that last one he did. Oh, yeah. His, you know, I don't know if he's ever done a bad monologue. Yeah. Yeah. He's, 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 I, that's, that's, that's one of my, that's my, not, not lasting, but one of the things on my bucket list that I, that I really have to do is SNL. Yeah. You know, I, it's not even just about the mon monologue. Cool. I got that. But like, I want to just do the funniest sketches you've seen. You know, a guy that doesn't get the credit that I think he deserves, and obviously, and, and this is, uh, we know what transpired outside of comedy, is Bill Cosby. Yeah. And you don't have the, you had a couple of run-ins with him. Well, you have it with everybody. Hold on. Hold on. I didn't have no run-in with Bill. That was Hannibal. Don't, don't. I, well, he ain't had no run-in with him neither. Nobody had a run-in with Bill Cosby. None of, us, none of us had no run. I think Gerard is the only one I know who had a conversation with Bill Cosby. Right. Anybody else? No. But he, well, we do a car. Hannibal, Hannibal had... Hannibal the one that told a joke that got everything seemingly reignited. So they so That's they, what they said. That's what they said. I don't blame. Like, you can't blame nobody that's a that this is the thing about it. So Cosby has been in conversations amongst the comedians in diners for years. Over, at, after one in the morning, we all eating food. It's literally been heated debate before before it even came out. Right, yes. It was just conversations about yeah. it. Yeah. And so like it's very interesting. Like I think Cosby is one of the greatest stand-up comics of all time. Mm -hmm. I do believe that. But he's not on my list. Right. I feel bad that I didn't put Sinbad on there. Oh, that's a tough one. Mm -hmm. See, that's why I don't like doing top five, man. Right. 
Why, why do you think some of the older comics have a problem with some of the younger comics? Oh, man, I could break that down. So you know what's funny about me, Shannon? I'm in between both classes right. of comics. So like, you know, my big brothers are Sid and D-Ray and all, all those guys. Right. And then my little brothers are Gerard and Hannibal and, and all those guys. Mm -hmm. And over the years, I've had to have heated arguments with some of my OGs about them. Like what they was just outright hating on some of them. Like, man, they the white people only like them and they only get the deals because they I'm like, fam, no, they work really hard. See, a lot of y'all got y'all money and bought cars and mm -hmm. jewelry and all this other stuff. That brother brought final draft and learned how to write a script. Right. This brother's, you know, I talk, I brag about Gerard all the time. I recently saw somebody say this, and, and I love my big brother, Corey Holcomb. I love him to death, Chicago OG, but he be saying crazy shit that doesn't make sense. Recently, he said something about Gerard. Now, this is so crazy. I just saw him, and we embraced, but he was being a little hesitant. I was like, but he didn't know I didn't see the Gerard thing first. Right. He called Gerard an industry plan, right? Because he said he had a sitcom, and he hosted a war. Just because you ain't got something, that don't mean everybody a plan. And that's my point. You call, I, you know, I got a little upset about it because I'm like, well, I've seen Gerard. I did Carmichael show with Gerard. Mm -hmm. Every single night, take that script home. After he leaves the writer's room with the writers, he took it home personally. Stayed up to about five, six in the morning. Had to meet us all on set at 7.30 to rehearse it. That's work ethic. You know yes. how people have success like that? Because they, they work. really put the work in. You're absolutely right. They fucking put the work in. And I know a lot of cats here, I n know you're not putting in that type of work. I love you to death, but you're not. And it's easy to say, hey, this person did it this easy route and did all this other shit because you don't know they work ethic. Right. You can't talk about you do, you write and do all this shit. It's, and it's, it's funny because I'm watching it from this older generation. And they all, everybody's like, yeah, you know, I was offered this movie, but then they wanted me. Which movie was it? So I can see what the, like, stop this shit. Because mm -hmm. every, some of us just worked our ass off. Right. Like, I was, even just hearing Kat hear all the things he's been through and why he didn't do this or go here and do this. Yeah, because you and Kat had some back and forth. Y'all cool now? No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but it's, it's okay. It's okay, though. It's okay. We don't have to be. Right. Because his success is his success right. and my success is my success. What started it? Well, this is the thing about it. That Wanda Smith interview. Yeah. The one, the part nobody talks about is, for no reason, Cat brings up me, Gerard, and Hannibal Burris. For no reason at all. Okay. I don't even know, remember what the fucking question was. He just literally like, you, ain't, you can't, <laughs> yeah, they're going to make you a style little real, but you ugly. Yeah. So what the fuck I got to do with this? <laughs> so you, you was in there with... That's, yeah, that's the beginning of the interview. He, that's what made Wanda kind of start fucking with him. Okay. Now, don't get me wrong. Like, <laughs> the whole Wanda back and forth for him is the funniest shit I've ever seen. Oh, yeah. And, and, you know, and Wanda wasn't always nice to all of us, no. to be quite honest with you. Right. So it was kind of, it was very interesting that all this transpired. It, it was interesting. Especially to see those two. It's, it's the craziest happenstance of all right. time. But that's what it was, Cat. I don't know what even what that meant. He said they're gonna make you just star Lil Rail, but you're ugly. He said Lil Rail, Gerard Carmichael, Hannibal can't walk the mall in Atlanta. I forgot the mall. Uh, Lennox. Lennox, and no woman would talk to them. And I, to this day, man, and I swear to God, I, I ain't trying to start no shit. I just don't understand. I, look, I don't think I'm the finest nigga in the world. Right. But a short nigga with a perm. Man, you know he's gonna see this and respond. I don't give a fuck. God, Lord, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, 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 it, if we were both two regular niggas in a month, right? And he has the perm and right the mustache, right? And I walk in like this with my regular shit. Who the fuck you think women gonna talk to? I don't know, Rail. I don't know. I ain't did it. I ain't did it. I'm just saying. So that, that's, the, that's the only irritating thing about that for me. Like Other than that, it's like, cat, brother, if I'm an ugly nigga, thank God, because that's why nothing didn't happen to me. Ain't nobody approached me. Right. Ain't nobody asked me to do shit. I guess I'm an ugly, talented nigga. Right. I'm okay with it. Man, Rail. God. <laughs>
Well, why you come up here upset the car? You know, I, I didn't do anything. You asked about it, and I'm just saying, like, and I and look, all comics, I, you know, y'all, all of us, like, man, we, everybody's like, come on, man, you gonna go? But Cat did say that shit. It was just weird. I just, I just, even when him talking about Jonathan Mays, it's like, how, who do Cat Williams think he look like? Like you're not an attractive person. You look God, fucking that, weird. Real, real. He does. <laughs> How about you? Have you talked to Cat? People dress like this nigga as Halloween, like him, not the character. Yeah. They don't when, dress as money, they the, dress as Cat Wynn. When the last time you saw Cat? <laughs> That's a crazy story, right? So, it was at the Emmys a couple years ago. So, this is when we into it. Like, we, this yeah, is happening. Yeah, y'all, okay, y'all go, y'all. We did the videos, it's happening. Mm -hmm. I just presented an award at the Emmys. I go backstage, right? And Chappelle don't know me and this dude beefing. Right. Chappelle sees me. Oh, Laurel. Oh, Williams. Cat. You know Laurel, Laurel, you know Cat. Now we just staring at each other. Oh, sh. Dave is like, what the fuck wrong with you two niggas, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> we ain't saying. Y'all just look at each other. Ain't nobody say and nothing. I'm balling my fist up. Like, you, you, you ever see the author meme? Yeah. I'm standing there with <laughs> We ain't saying shit to each other. And he's holding his Emmy. He has his Emmy in his hand. <laughs> that was the last time I saw it. Nothing happened. He just walked away. Y'all didn't say, hey, what's up, bro? Say, it wasn't, nigga. I was, because I was still fuming. At that time, it was like, yo, are we about to, like, what the fuck about to happen back here? Because it's. Kyle Morrell? Yeah, I'm a Chicago nigga, too. So it's yeah. like, I mean, we about to do this. <laughs> oh my goodness. You about to turn the Emmys into the source of wolf. <laughs> you once said that you believe Cat was jealous of you. You still feel that way? Nah, I was just talking shit. I don't think he's jealous of me. I I, I do think he's jealous of Kevin Hart and I and it's so weird because he don't have to be. Like, brother, you are so fucking successful. Mm-hmm. Like, you're one of the most successful stand-up comedians we've ever seen. Mm -hmm. You didn't have the hype machine. Honestly, he's the benefit of bootleg DVDs. You remember what they, they, they Yeah. Every, and this in Chicago, I remember being in Chicago at the mm -hmm. time, everybody had that Cat Williams special in their house. Right. And because, you know, bootleg helped comedy at that time. Right. Because those people go buy tickets to see you. Right. Yeah, absolutely. The bootleg man really was your damn, he was your promoter. Yes. They watch you at the crib and you were selling all your shows and, and Kat benefited from that, man. Right. And I think I think he's not even just stand up. Man, like anytime you see him on screen. Oh yeah. He just won an Emmy for Atlanta, right? He won that shit for Atlanta. He fucking every time you seen him on wife and kids, like he was fucking great on there. Yeah. He was like you see him on like even the school dance movie, we know that's not a good movie. Right. But only thing you watch is that clip. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's yeah. fucking brilliant. Mm -hmm. And so like and I'm, look, let me say this. I was just, I'm talking shit. We roast each other. We comics. That's right. what it is. I don't give a fuck. Whatever you say about me out there, I don't give a fuck. Rat's ass. Uh, but at the same time, I do, I, I really do wish that we could, I'm not trying to sound like some old, let's get along shit, but like, God damn. There's no reason why we can't do another Harlem Nights with all this great fucking talent. Or like, not even Harlem Nights, but just a movie yeah. that features everybody. Right. You know what I mean? All the nights were great. Man, like Nick tried to do it with school dance, but like let's find something with like a really good script. Right. Some really dope shit and like fucking get all these powerhouses on fucking screen together. Like I'm sick of this shit. Right. It doesn't make fucking sense. You know, it's not, it's, you know, you, and it's, it, be honest with you, it's a bunch of old beefs. So I'll say this right now. Cat, look, I'm just talking shit. I ain't mad at you. I can give a rat's ass. I respect the fuck out of you. You want the greatest to ever do it. Even if you talk shit about me after this, I don't really give a fuck. But I respect you and I respect all y'all. So like, I just think we all should figure out a way to like merge this shit up, man. Like we all talk shit, man. But I don't think we should bring in our behind the scenes comedy mess. Right. I don't know for, just call, call these people. Right. Call Ricky and tell Ricky, hey man, Ricky, I didn't like the way you was talking shit on the Friday set about how that was supposed to be your role. And just talk it out. Right. Call Sid and say, Sid, man, I felt like that joke, that really a joke that's not even a big fucking deal, and they both do it totally differently. And it's a joke none of you need anymore. Right. Let's talk this shit out. Even with Steve Harvey, talk this shit out, man. You know, Bernie, we don't have to show Bernie love by shitting on somebody else. Oh, real. 
Bernie's one of the greatest to ever fucking do it. One of the hugest influences ever in this game. He's one of the cats to me that always gonna represent a grown ass man in his fucking business. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if Bernie would let this shit fly like this. Cause he wasn't that type of dude. He wasn't yeah. gonna be, you know, even when Bernie talked about, uh, even they've been playing a clip of him talking about comic stealing jokes. Right. But he won't, that's, that's real advice to this day. It's the reason why I don't go up to LA a lot. Right. <laughs> we gonna steal your shit. Nigga. <laughs> <laughs> and so like, and, and I get it because most of the time people want to do what they think is the hot thing to do. Right. If you're the hot thing, guess who they gonna, they gonna mimic mm. to make it. Cause mm. everybody want to make it. Right. That's what they, people talk about all this other shit. I'm like, no, nah, like people steal styles and mm -hmm. dialect and all types of shit. Cause they like, well, this person made it. So, you know, I don't know. That's, that's, I just, I, I love, and, that, and let me give you some props too, because and any other comic that does this after this, we realize, I realize how mainstream you are. I don't know if you know that shit and you've only had us on here. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, for the most part, you know, I told my story, hopefully inspired somebody. Yeah. That's what we should be doing. Right. Telling our stories and promoting each other. Not even just in stand up, in fucking movies or TV. We have to, we have movies like The Color Purple. Dion Cole, a comic, is in Color Purple. Come on, man. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Comic View, Def Jam, is in a reimagined movie in co Color Purple. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. And so we have all these things happening. We, you know, we got the, the Ava DuVernay's and the movies like Origin and fucking uh, American Fiction. With, man, I love every, I watch and I love everybody. Now I don't know like cornball shit. I just love, I, Shannon, I love this shit. Mm -hmm. I love stand up. I love movies. I love TV. I thank God every day that I'm able to be, I had a moment when we was in quarantine. I was sitting at home. And I was watching TV and I was on like three things, like I had three of my movies on. And I remember sitting back on my couch talking to myself and it's something I learned at therapy, but I was talking to little me like, oh shit, you made it inside, you made it inside the TV. Mm -hmm. I used to only watch that to take me away from shit. Right. It was so unrealistic, but I made it inside there. Didn't do anything crazy. Didn't have no connections. I just worked really hard. And look at this. Wow. You were supposed to be in the reboot of Living Color. Yeah. What happened? Hmm. It's really hard to tell. <laughs> I don't, like we shot it and. Was it funny? Man, it was so much fun. It was so funny. I mean, the opening skit, I mean, I guess I could tell it now is, <laughs> Is Kenny Ivory Wayne's. He's sitting in the Fox office in 1990, whatever time he walked mm -hmm. away. They're like, you'll never come, you'll never have a show on Fox again. You'll never be here. Blah, blah, blah. They, they, the white guys are telling them off. Mm -hmm. And him looking at the camera, he just goes, do, 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 do. And we, and we back. Right. And so it's opening with that, which maybe one of the reasons why it didn't come on, <laughs> which I thought was explosive. Right. Can I tell you? Man, I learned so much from Keen Ivory Wayne's. I wrote a show called Name Your Adventure when I was 10 years old. Okay. 10 years old, that's when I was writing everybody. I wrote Different World. Right. I wrote Name Your Adventure. And uh, it used to be a show that my man used to play A.C. Slater. I forgot his name. Mario Lopez. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I wrote Name Your Adventure to be on The Living Color. I right. didn't want to go surfboarding. I didn't want to do anything. I said, hey, Hi, my name is Mr. Milton Howery. I would like to be on Name Your Adventure to go on a living color and meet Ken Ivory Wayne's. And I wrote that letter and they wrote me back and said, well, the show's canceled, but hey, keep on dreaming. Right. And I told Keenan that story, <clears throat> our, our first meeting once I booked the show. And um, man, that, that was one of, you talk about moments. That's, that's one of my favorite moments of, so they, they were showcasing comics. Um, and I had to fly to New York to showcase for it. And I didn't have, me and my manager flew there. We had no people in the crowd. You could tell the other comedians that's on the showcase. They invited family members right. and friends. So they got their people in there, you know what I'm saying? I'm in New York from Chicago, nobody in there. Just me and my manager, Knowledge Beckham, shout out to Knowledge. And uh, <laughs> I see Keenan get out of limo. I'm like, oh 
shit, can't. Like, you know, you, you know, you, you know, yeah, you, you have a moment. Man, you like, it's a figure you never saw in real life. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh shit, he's tall. He's, this is, shit, it's Keenan Ivory Wayans. And I'm like, I gotta go crazy. I went on that stage and. Man, and, and shout out to uh, I forgot Shonda's last name, but Shonda Ryan? No, nah, not Shonda Rhimes. Uh, but she was she's very close to Keenan and was helping them book okay. the color. She found me on YouTube. You know that's how they found me. Right, it's a crazy story. It's like they was watching somebody else's video on YouTube, mm -hmm. and my video popped up afterwards. Random shit. I didn't even post that video. So I'd never give them niggas props who posted my damn set and then asked my permission. But they the reason why I booked the Living Color. And so they saw me on that, invited me to New York. I went on stage and went eight. I could tell the crowd was trying not to laugh at me. They like, right. cause they did to support their people, but right. I'm like, I'm you, you killing them. I'm going crazy. Shonda, we never met her before. She comes give me a hug. And I, I, I thought I killed. After the show, I see Keenan. I'm ready to see Keenan like, yo, Mr. Wayne is I mean, what you think? He was like, hmm. Like, motherfucker. Like, <laughs> come on. That's what he did. That's all he gave you. Cause I'm gonna tell you something about the Wayans. They keep they shit in house. Right. Whatever the fuck, everything's in house. And I remember the first conversation I had. I said, "Hey man, why did you?" Because I got a call like the next week that I got picked to come out to L.A. and mm -hmm. do the and do the um the what's the name uh, whatever you call it the last audition. And he was like, "No, I didn't. I didn't want you to be all hyped up about it. You know, you did your thing. I didn't have to tell you that." But I was outside, like, Ken, <laughs> he's all that did, yeah. right, Playboy? Yeah. He's like, mm. Mm. <laughs> you look at all the look at all the comedians that were on uh, Living Color: David Evan Greer, Tommy Davidson, uh, Jamie Foxx, Jim Carrey. I mean, who was probably the most inspirational to you? Who inspired oh, you the most? That's a great fucking question. Honestly, it, it is Keenan. It's Keenan Ivory Wayans, and the reason why it is. He put all that shit together. Yeah. And and they all come from this cool group too, because it's, <laughs> it's Eddie Murphy, Keenan, Robert Towns. Mm -hmm. That's they that's that click. Yeah. Those guys changed to me not only black Hollywood, but Hollywood in general. Mm -hmm. And comedy. The, the they all are forces that will be reckoned with. Right. And it started with Eddie. Mm -hmm. That's why if you look at the raw credits, you did you see it? You saw who directed it? Robert Townsend. Mm -hmm. You saw who wrote the opening sketch, Keenan Ivory Wayans. He brought in his homeboys with that. These, like, three of the greatest whatevers of all time created all this different shit. And Keenan found a way to merge hip hop, and hip hop was still new at the time. Mm -hmm. And Living Color was putting hip hop stars that never got a television credit at first. Mm -hmm. The Fly Girls yep. embraced the culture of it. I mean, the Super Bowl halftime show only exists because of Living Color. People forget that it was halftime of the Super Bowl and Living Color did a special. Everybody turned to a Living Color. Ratings through the roof. Guess who the NFL booked the next year? Michael goddamn Jackson. Jackson. Come on, fam. So Keenan is always, to me, is going to be like, you know, that's one of the only people that's ever told me that I was going to be okay. Right. That I took that fucking shit right. serious. How, how do you land the role in the Carmichael show? Being friends with Gerard, you know, I, I tell, here we go. This is very interesting. I tell comics this all the time. You don't know who going to be what. So be careful how you treat Muff. Mm -hmm. I met Gerard when he was new. He walked up to me like, hey, man, I'm a big fan. I'm like, hi, you little scruffy looking kid. But, you know, we had a conversation and we became friends. And honestly, I remember texting him congratulations about his deal, I heard about when he got his deal with NBC. And he's like, man, that's crazy you hit me. I was thinking about having you come in and read. So this is the first, the funny thing. The Carmichael show was set up a different way than it was and you guys ended up seeing it. It was, a, it was supposed to be about him and his friends. Right. The show. I auditioned for it. Great audition. NBC loves me. The producers love me. Everybody loves me. And my manager's like, I'm like, what's the problem? Everybody, you say everybody like me? He's like, yeah, but Gerard, Wait, Gerard, he asked me to do this fucking audition, so he the one that's not picking me? And I call said, Gerard, why you not? He said, because oh, you did it differently than I envisioned the character. 
So yeah, but everybody else loved it. He's like, no, but that's not what I, that's not how I wrote it. You know, that's not how I visioned it. I was like, man, this motherfucker. But then I had to respect it too. Right. I said, man, it's your show, it's your book. Right, you do what you do. But then he rewrote the shit to make it a family structure based off his family. And he wrote Bobby exactly the way I uh, performed it. And? And that's how I got the show. I got, all I had to do was come in for a screen test. And I did exactly what he asked me to do, and I booked the show. I remember I was supposed to be long gone. You know how people start deliberating about you? Right. So I was waiting on my, my car. <laughs> I'm sitting there eating lunch, and I could watch them deliberate about me. And they like, yo, you still on the studio lot? I said, yeah, I got to wait on my ride. I've been here for like an hour. <laughs> right. But yeah, that's how I got it. It's, it's being friends with Gerard. Gerard is, I mean, even just the way Tiffany, Tiffany wasn't supposed to be on the show. Right. He wrote this shit in. Which I, sometimes I hate when I get Gerard personal information because mm -hmm. I was going through a divorce at the time. And the next thing you know, I had an ex-wife on the show. And I'm like, what the fuck, man? <laughs> you giving a man ideas. I was calling him an event one day. And next thing you know, I had an ex-wife on the show. You mentioned Tiffany, Tiffany Haddish as being one of your best friends. Yeah. She's kind of had a couple of mishaps um, over the last couple of months. You talked to her. What's going on? How, how do you, how do you, how does rail get Tiffany back on the straight and narrow? Well, it's not rail doing that. It's Tiffany's doing that. She's putting the work in, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm so proud of her. And it was what I was saying earlier to you about like, you know, just taking some time for yourself. You know, I think, you know, her, you know, she lost her grandmother. Right. Um, she lost like one of her oldest dogs. She loved, like, I know her forever. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, she just has so many loss, just loss. And I, I think she just, she didn't take enough time to like deal with certain things. Right. And her machine is like this. She works all the time. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the, a lot of the stuff she was going through more or less is fatigue. You got to rest. Mm -hmm. You know, I give back to Kat's advice. Don't let these niggas burn you out. Right. <laughs> and that's real. You do have to pace yourself and she's fine. Like she's, she's, she's holding herself accountable for things. You know, you know, and I, you know, you saw I ain't had a con yet because I, you know, I'm, I'm not drinking also, you know, me and her had a, a very heart to heart about both of us taking those steps right. in general. It's just like, like, what are we doing? Like learning to not participate in things just because it's available to you and taking time for yourself. Right. So I'm proud of her. And, you know, Tiffany's one of the best people in the world. I, I, I feel bad for her a lot of times because people like love to attack her. Mm hmm. And it's so fucking weird to me. Like one of the nicest people you'll ever meet, one of the most hardworking people you'll ever meet. Um, but, you know, I always tell her, like, that's why you can't care about pleasing people. Mm -hmm. You know, you care about what everybody fucking thinks, man. That's draining. Right. And I, I mean, you, we already in a business where people, you're going to already have critics and all this other mm -hmm. shit. Don't take in all that shit. Right. I, you don't owe anybody anything. You know what I'm saying? You don't right. owe nobody shit. If somebody did something for me and it wasn't out the goodness out of your heart, then that's fucked up on you. I don't owe you shit. Right. Right. <laughs> you know what right. I'm saying? And so I'm I'm proud of her. She's doing so well. And, and only she can, only adults can work on themselves. Nobody right. can do, you know what I mean? Do you think, <clears throat> should they do another girl trip too? I think so. It'll be interesting too now because they can do so many different storylines with all of them now. Right. But they like, it might be even funnier to be quite honest with you. Right. Hmm. Yeah, I love that. It's a Ray insecure. It's part of you've been in. What's so? Let me ask you this, Ray. How do you do? You just they they send you scripts and then you let? Or do you say nah? This ain't for me. How do you go about? Okay, this is something I might be interested in. I think I might be interested in it. Or do you just like read everything? Well, that's interesting. You say that now. Insecure is a, a very cool story, but like in general, for me, I do, I get scripts sent to me all the time. With, right. I do so many movies, everybody think I be saying yes to everything, but right. I really don't. I turn down a lot of stuff, actually. Um, but then I get a lot of really good stuff. Everything I've ever done is stuff I really wanted to do. Right. Now, sometimes I'm just a fan of something. So I'm a big fan of Insecure. You know right. what I'm saying? Huge fan of the shit. Mm -hmm. Huge fan of all of them. And I remember telling Issa, like, man, I wanna, I gotta be, I wanna be, you gotta find something for me, you know what I mean? And I remember telling Yvonne, Yvonne Orgy, who, you know, plays a bet, paid her best friend on the show, mm -hmm. and one of my closest friends, I wanted to be on the show. She gave me a call one random day. I said, Rail, 
I, I don't really like the cats I'm reading with. I think you should come in for this, for this, right. this play this lawyer. Mm -hmm. Maybe love interest. Type of right. Okay. I was like, all right. And this is how beautiful our group is. Our And I was just, me and Issa just had lunch, so we were just talking about mm -hmm. this. Because it was like this weird back-to-back -back years where all of us was like, nobodies and all of us had this shit going on and it was crazy mm -hmm. and i remember yvonne telling me this shit they sent me, and i think i might have text isa so i don't forget whatever happened and they sent me the robe i dressed up i was doing carmichael show at the time okay and i had to get permission to do it because i was you know on nbc mm -hmm. and i said okay gerard i said gerard hey can i do insecure and i remember like the network really didn't want me to do it all the producers like ah, nah. he's like Bro, i don't give a fuck isa's our friend go do it i'm like cool so I went to go read for, I dressed up as the lawyer. I ain't never really dressed up as, I really wanted this fucking part. And I dressed up as, as the lawyer at, uh, and I remember the, it was a guy there who was tested with me and he saw me all dressed up. And this one get out was like already out. Yeah. Like, man, what the fuck? Hey man, you already on the show? Come on. Why you want to be on this shit? Like you could tell nigga was like, God damn, this nigga real here. Uh, they gonna give it to him. Yeah, I ain't finna get this part. I showed up. I showed up dressed as a lawyer. I got I got the lawyer outfit from the Carmichael Show costumers. Right. I said, could y'all give me a lawyer outfit real quick to go do this audition? Matter of fact, that was the last audition I had. It was insecure. And so I did that and I booked it. And man, I'm so glad I got a chance to be a part of it. That was my first sex scene. Was it's me and Yvonne's. Right. Insecure say, which is the craziest. You learn a lot about it. Right. Yeah. I heard the majority of her her staff is a uh are women. All women in there. How how important is that? You know something? Is is it, what makes that even very important is just it was the jobs they had. Right. That I've never seen women do. Right. I never seen women do grips. Th at that time I didn't. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I never seen like when I tell you, it was like three people on set, Princess Penny, which is the showrunner. Right. Me, Jay, me, him, and Jay Ellis was the only three dudes on set one day, and it was all women. And, and I've never, that was the first time I ever felt like, oh, we the, we the minority. <laughs> right. But it felt good. And it felt good seeing all those black women and women just laughing mm -hmm. and having a good time to collaborate with each other. I've never seen nothing like that before. Right. Taraji P. Henson has been in the news lately where she's saying that people like her work extremely hard, not getting paid their worth. Where, where, where do you come down on this rail? What's what's going on with Hollywood and our black actresses? Well, I don't. It's not even just black actresses. It's black actors. Exactly. <laughs> you know, I remember when I was doing my show Rail, right? Mm -hmm. And one of those magazines leaked everybody's salaries, mm -hmm. like who had shows on network TV, right? And when I saw the the margin of like, mm -hmm. it didn't. I couldn't believe what I was looking at. When I saw what you know, what like a Tim Allen was making, and for just acting. Oh yeah. And I'm like, wait a minute, I gotta produce, write, right. star. I figured out another way where I could play a different character every episode, so I got a, a separate check for this. Right. Shit. I would think about every way I get a check, and this what he just getting for acting. Mm. It was a disgusting way more amount. It didn't right. make any sense, mm -hmm. and it wasn't even just about me because I could look at it like, oh, I'm new, and so it's my first, whatever, whatever. But I looked at the other black veterans with shows, and mm -hmm. I'm like, this is what they're making? Look, I say a couple of things have to happen. You got to be able to say no, and you got to have the right team also. Mm -hmm. Right, we, we, yeah, we're asking Hollywood. They definitely need to investigate that because that's a problem. Like, right. It's like, it's with everybody. But you do have to have the right fucking team. Right. Angela Bassett right now is the highest, one of the highest paid women on television right now. Like she's getting a crazy bag. Right. As she deserved. And probably deserved it way. Way back. Right. Yeah. And so I just really believe that. And and also too, we all have to be honest with each other. Right. And I'm talking about I, I speak to the camera again. Brothers, black actors, males, men, fam. Like we have to be honest with our sisters about this too. This is the only way all this is gonna change. Cause right now everybody like to look cool, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like I don't want nobody to know it. You know I want to look like, nah, fam, you know what it is. We all get fucked on this. Right. I remember when Sherry Shepard was working on something and she called me, and she was working on a deal, and I said, well, this is what I got. This is what you should ask for. Da -da 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 -da. I was very honest. Mm -hmm. That's all we have to do is be honest. Let's start with being honest with each yeah. other, right? Mm -hmm. And then we have to communicate that. Right. 
and just, you know, push our teams. Right. Fuck that shit, man. Like, if I did this and that, this did this numbers, Taraji P. Henson has done box office. Yes. Award winning. Mm -hmm. Yes. At the minimum, she'd be good. She'd be, she'd be, she'd be like 10 a movie. At the at a minimum. Sure. Absolutely. Because motherfuckers is getting a bag. <laughs> Your sitcom. If you could go back, do anything differently, what would you do different? A lot of shit. One of the biggest things I wish I'd have did better at was um, trusting my writers more. And trusting everybody. I think sometimes that strike the iron wise hot mentality or I know for me, I wanted to represent black people so bad. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to do whatever it was. I put too much on myself, man. Mm -hmm. And I should have trusted more to the people I hired to do that. I was stressed the fuck out doing that shit. Right. Like I really was, but it was, it was fun. But that one of the things I would just trust everybody, not even just my writers. I could have did a better job at trusting and, and being a, a better leader. But I, I, but I analyzed myself after that right. with my friends, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it was a lot of changes I had to make after that because I put a lot on myself with that show. Um, I heard you earlier say the last audition was get out, right? Yeah. And, and yeah. You, well, really insecure. That insecure. Like. <laughs> but you don't, you haven't. So now they just send you the script and say, hey, we kind of wrote the script. And then, you know, a lot of times if I like, so it's a process, right? They'll send you the script. They say, ready, offer this to you. I'll look at the script or, or two pager, you know, sometimes my manager do a two pager for me. Um, and then I tell them I like it. And then either I meet with a producer or director, just go break bread. Like it's one of the, like the cool little restaurants, right. like catch it some, mm -hmm. just talk it out, um, see what the energy feels like. And then just take it from there. That's right. literally been that simple. It's been like, which is why like, I, once again, when I hear these, I hear the horror stories. Right. But I'm like, Jesus Christ, I've never been through that. Thank God. Right. It's been the most regular, normalest thing you could think of. Like brunch or lunch, it. yeah. It talk about the script, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's so. What was the table read like for uh, Get Out? Man. Did you know it was gonna be what it became? None of us knew that. Not, not like none of. Well, let, let me say this, Shannon. So we didn't do a table read for it. Okay. But I remember my one on one with Jordan Peele. Okay. It was my callback audition. Right. And. We did the scene that we took out. So it was the original ending. The original ending is uh, Daniel Kaluuya's character goes to jail. Okay. And I go visit him in jail and I'm trying to get him to tell me what happened so I can at least like try mm -hmm. to find a way to get him out of right. it. But he's kind of just like, man, you know what it is. I'm black. They're not going to let me out, bro. Mm -hmm. Just leave it alone. <laughs> it's such a dark, hard scene. Yes. And that's the scene we did the callback for. And I remember, because it's very emotional, because even we shot that that one first, I remember I couldn't even hear Jordan Peele yell cut. We all were so, like, emotional about that. Mm -hmm. It was very telling. I remember him just going, cut, and everybody took a walk. <laughs> it was it's just a, and we was outside and it felt silence. Right. And um, we did that scene. I walk out wait, waiting on my Uber. Jordan Peele follows me out. He's like, look, man, I ain't supposed to tell you this shit, but it's yours if you want it. I said, what? The movie? I'm literally, I got like four homies in there about to go in there and read. Right. I said, what you mean? You got four people? He's like, you know, I'm going to call your team, but it's yours. And look, Shannon, I didn't know what this movie was going to be. Right. But when I tell you, and this is 100% this is what happened. I literally walked... I don't, I don't know how many blocks I walked. I walked from where I did the audition at to wherever the fuck I was at, praising God. And I didn't know what Get Out was going to be. Right. It was my first feature film. It was just, it's something felt special about it. Right. I can't even describe that. And then like, even when the trailer came out and it did all these numbers and we went to, we had to go do reshoots because we reshot the ending. Right. Cause now we got some, you know, the trailer did well, Universal and gave some months, some more money. So now right. we're able to, you know, and so we're, we all sitting around just kind of like, I guess having like a cocktail mm -hmm. and we was like, me, Daniel, like all of us was looking at each other like, 
what the fuck is this finna be? <laughs> Cause the trailer went crazy. Right. We were just like, Did Jordan have any idea what this was going? He did. The brother told me while he was editing it, he called me and said, man, get ready. Know your price. Know your number. I ain't know what the fuck that meant. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, man, you go, all right, you about to see. It was Christian to be coming. It to be coming. He knew it. I, like, it's, it's, I remember the first time I watched Get Out, it was so good to be. I'm like, am I think this is good because I'm in it? <laughs> no, that shit, it was, it was <laughs> that, that was, that was a good one. That was, so, so how did that movie, you said, he said, name your price so in other words that movie changed the pay scale for real it changed the pay scale it changed how it was looked at I me mean, because from there is where the sitcom comes that's where this comes mm -hmm. you know it was it became my back-to-back -back, and we only in 24 now that i think about it mm -hmm. i'm like damn the last five years six years been fucking crazy which is why, like, I'm like, and I don't like to do that for myself, I guess. Not boast or nothing, but I'm like, whoa, as a stand up, as a person who comes from BET's Comic View. Mm -hmm. 21, BET Comic View, that's what I take, my first TV thing, mm -hmm. to being in Oscar nominated movies, streaming breaking movies. <laughs> I'm like, wow, it's crazy to me. So what'd you buy with that first big check then? <laughs> so funny. The first big check was a, was a get out back end check. <laughs> Cause get out, we did for like, it was a low, it was literally, get out was on a 2B budget. <laughs> yeah. 2B movie budget. Yeah. And so, you know, I did that for the SAG, uh, whatever, the SAG minimum. Minimal. They delivered my back end check. A brother had on a TSA uniform with a cake. I thought I was just getting a cake. I didn't know why he was there. Right. I thought, oh, yeah, the movie, the movie's doing well. Oh, right. cool. Thank you for the cake. Oh, he's like, oh, here's a check. And this is what I had this apartment. The kids was upstairs with my cousin Jennifer. I looked, I did this, went upstairs, said, everybody get dressed. We're going shopping. I just went and bought some toys and shit. Right. Bought me a couple pairs of Jordans. But not yeah, that's what I did. Not <laughs> no British night, huh? No, nah, but these motherfuckers are hidden. <laughs> you, brought, you brought some Jordan. But I mean, now look at uh, Judas, Black Messiah, Good Boys, Bird Box. I mean, you've been in Paw Patrol. Top. Bro. So that movie, you became, after that, you became a household name. I became a household name and, and my name started circulating in Hollywood. Right. You know, that's... Man, that's that to me. That's still surreal. I still pinch myself because I know how hard it is. Right. You know, I see friends all the time still self taping and doing all these different things. I'm like, shit. And the weird part about that is, this is why I say it's such a beautiful thing to celebrate others. Mm -hmm. When Tiffany came out with Girls Trip, matter of fact, when we saw her film Girls Trip, me and Hannibal went to Essence Festival literally last minute one year. It was mm -hmm. we probably could write a movie about Hannibal and Real at Essence that first year. Right. We had no passes. We had the best time in the world. We were just, we saw Insecure the first time. Like, it was fucking crazy. Right. And I remember watching Tiffany walk with Queen Latifah and Jada Pickett Smith. It was a scene they did in the auditorium, and she's walking with them. And I'm like, blown away. Like, yo, she gone. You walk, you were, you in a movie with Queen Latifah and J mm -hmm. Tiffany gone, fam. <laughs> and so celebrating people with my friends, I think I've always given myself good karma with that shit. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, for sure. You've been in a movie with Lakeith Stanfield, Kevin Hart, Ryan Reynolds. I love that movie, you and Ryan Reynolds. Oh, Free Guy. Free Guy was unbelievable. Free Guy is, Free Guy is is still, oh, it's, it's a story to that. I don't, you know, I don't know if I even told that one, but it's a movie that to me, it was a time I almost thought I got blacklisted, black, <laughs> kicked out of Hollywood. Why? Um. A producer I was working with, I won't say which film it was, but he was just doing too much. And, you know, I checked him on it. He was 
being inappropriate. You know what I'm saying? Um, he couldn't believe I called him. I'm like, man, yo, you tripping? Don't don't fucking do that again. Don't you know? Don't talk to her like that. Whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is before the Me Too shit. So you know, my mother was like, oh, you don't know how Hollywood goes, and blah blah blah. And luckily, we was at the end of the movie, so right. even if he wanted to kick me off, we done. This is the last day. Right. And so you know, we get into it, an argument about it. And he started telling all these people about all this, about me and saying all this fucked up shit. He was saying like I was bringing girls on set and all this other shit. Just lying, just cause I called him out on his shit cause he was right. being fucking weird. Right. And uh, he couldn't believe I did that. Right. But that shit pissed me off. I'm like, nah, you, you can't, that's wrong, bro. Mm -hmm. And um, man, he went around and man, he made his rounds. And so I thought I was done. I'm like, I gotta go back to Chicago. Mm. I just do stand up. They kick him out. Like, I, like I, I can't be his words. Right. You know, and at the time, Free Guy came around. And Sean Levy and Ryan, you know, heard whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, I'm not going to even get Free Guy now. Because I just met with Sean. It was a, it was a go. Right. Yeah. I'm like, damn. And I remember my team calling me. And, and they wanted me, you know, they was giving me an option to apologize to the producer of Makeup Men, but I was like, fuck that dude. If I get kicked out of it, I didn't even do shit. Right. So if I get kicked out of this shit for not doing, I didn't do anything in the, this motherfucker did. Right. So I'm about to get blacklisted for what? Cause I said something to him. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, damn, I guess I'm done. And Ryan and Sean hit me up and was like, you know, don't worry about that. You come ready to work. Professional, do what you do. We got you. We give a fuck what he talking about. We know he's an asshole. And three hours, my olive branch in a way was like, oh, sh like I, I loved him for that mm -hmm. because I thought I was out. You right. know what I'm saying? And no, these and they took care of me, and I learned a lot. Like Ryan Reynolds is one of the most professional, dopest people, and that was a dad set too. Yeah. We all had our kids that mm -hmm. so nice to my kids. You know, Ryan had his daughters there, and you know, Sean had his daughters in the movie, and like it was just a it was a family set, right. man. And once again, and it was tough because when you do movies like Get Out, and I do movies like Free Guy, and I love organized productions and mm -hmm. directors. And the motherfucker had a story built right there. It was crossed. Just so, just organized. I love when I could just show up and just act. And it's like, I ain't got no, I'm just here to act. Right. Because everything is so right. together. And uh, man, them dudes. So yeah, shout out to Ryan Reynolds. And, like, I, man, thank them for giving me the opportunity to, to even show even more of my gift. And, you know, that it was okay that I stood up. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, for sure. Bird Box with Sandra Bullock. Oh, Sandy. Could you, I mean, what, I mean, it was, it went crazy. Every, that's, it was trending forever. I mean, when you're shooting it, do I mean, could you get a sense? Nah, like you, I mean, you do know this, you know, it's Sandra Bullock mm -hmm. and she does well. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, you know, it's going to do good. Right. But when I tell you, we were all texting each other, Sandra Bullock. Like, I was like, yo, is this a thing? Mm -hmm. People started walking around doing the videos. Right. I, I like, and I was like on vacation at the time. I, I took right. my little, I used to take a once a year vacay for myself. Right. Because it came out around Christmas. Right. And so I was in Hawaii in the water, just reading, <laughs> like, what the hell is going on? And it was number one. It was just, it, you know, mm -hmm. we broke records with that. You did? Yeah. Uh, the Sundance mu Music, uh, the film festival. Britney runs a marathon. Does, I mean, real. I mean, yo. I mean, think about. I mean, do you sit, do you ever sit back and think, man, from Chicago to doing stand up to you know, to movies and TV. Do you ever have a? Do you have you taken a chance to look back and reflect and see where you are now to where you came from? Man, when I tell you, Shan, I do it all the time, and I'm so grateful. Like people love to talk about evil and how you get things, the evilness of it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had to say somebody sold their soul into the Illuminati and this and that. Man, when I tell you God has showed up every single time, like 
every single time. Mm -hmm. Like it, it is, it blows my mind every single day, every single time God has just showed up. Mm -hmm. You know, when my mother passed, I remember we were planning her funeral and that was my first time. I'm the oldest, so I had to kind of like sit with my aunties and I love them all for that. We planning a funeral and it's tough. And my uncle walks in. <laughs> I told you the red eye mm -hmm. newspaper used to be in the Chicago right. sometimes. Guess who's on the cover of the red eye? Me. Didn't know it. That was going to happen. Right. Okay. It was because the Just for Last Festival, which I was telling you about, yep. was in Chicago. Chicago. That year. Okay. And they put me, it wasn't even the biggest name, on the cover of the red eye to promote the festival. Wow. Didn't know that was going to happen. He walks in with these stack of red eyes and my uncle, one of them old black pads. Hey, Doc, you see what I told you, Doc? Told you, God got you, don't he, Doc? And I remember I had to like grab that and just walk out the room and just be like, I love moments where like God's like, it's gonna be okay. Mm -hmm. And that was a moment where I wasn't sure if it was. But it God always show up like that, like, damn, here we go. And you know, once again, moments like Get Out was that moment. When I when we did the, the premiere for Get Out. Yes. When I walked the red carpet earlier, nobody knew who the fuck I was. Right. So nobody everybody had one interview. Okay. I walked out that theater. The security had to walk me to my car. Wow. Because the people bum rushed me and my my people I was with my family. And I was just like, oh shit, what the fuck is gonna happen? You know, it's just, it, it, I, I've said this, I've done a great job of taking in that moment. Mm -hmm. And so the moment where I had that moment, what you're talking about, that reflective moment, mm -hmm. was that last special. That's why I, lo I love it. I tell people, go watch the special, just watch the end of it. Watch me, that is me in that moment, looking in that audience, watching Chicago stand up for me in the Chicago theater. Seeing my mama there, seeing Bernie there, and just seeing myself like I really did this shit. Wow. <laughs> How were you able to find someone in the business? Because, and then you said, you said your ideal date, a five star restaurant and a strip club. Boy, you could get more, more of a contrast. <laughs> I mean, that used to be my ideal date. <laughs> so what's the ideal date now? Mm, that's going to sound grown as hell. Dinner and a nap? Well, <laughs> dinner and a nap. Yeah, well, <laughs> what happened after dinner to call you to take that nap? The food. We old. We be like, <laughs> <laughs> you know some, And it's funny. You're right. It is tough to find love out here. I did, I, Yvonne just reminded me. I was all in a screen the other day. And she saw me with my fiance. She's like, you remember you, you, you was, cause I was one day, I was irritated. I'm like, you know something? I'm just in these fucking streets, right? I was just like pissed and we was all right. hanging out. They're like, you remember that day you was yelling like you done? You ain't gonna find nobody out here in LA and Hollywood. Cause da, 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 da. Now you just gonna be in the streets. And then Danella came out of nowhere. And it's like, well, not out of nowhere, but she, yeah, changed my life. You, uh oh, you were married before. Yeah, this is, this would be my second time around the sun. Did you think you'd get remarried again? I wanted to, but at some point it started feeling like I wasn't going to meet no, like, cause especially when you do what you do, you do what I do. And then I stopped seeing if anybody really liked me for me type of thing. And just, you know, everybody intentions is all weird. So I don't know, man. So I was like, oh, I guess I'm in the streets. Right. <laughs> but you proposed, hold on. You proposed at the Beyonce concert? Proposed at the Beyonce concert. Yeah, that, that, that was. Do you ever get, because you, we see this all the time, people proposing at sporting events and all these events. Do you get nervous? You're like, nah, I'm good. Fam, I was so nervous. I, and I'm never nervous, which is what, you know what made me nervous? is my son. My son is my oldest son. He's an asshole. He's like, yo, dad, what if she says no? I said, why the hell would you put that in my head? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. See, you thinking the same thing I'm thinking. <laughs> Were you more nervous to propose or more nervous during a scene? It was, a, you know what the nervousness was? It was, I don't know if it was nervous of her no. Right. It's nervous of how life changing this is. And it was more or less like the butterflies of like, I really, 
God, thank you for letting me find her. I didn't think I would do this again. Mm -hmm. I didn't think I have an opportunity to do this again. Right. Or not even just again. It's even deeper than that because once again, I've been married before, but it's like, oh, I didn't know I would meet my true, uh, like somebody who feels like a real full-blown soulmate. Right. And that's, you know, and I mean, the way we met is a sweet thing. She just, she's dope, man. Yeah. I read what, like, what you do with your kids is that you give them credits. You put them in your, your stand-up, you make sure they get production, they get uh, credits on your, what, what made you, how did you decide to, what, how did that come about? Nas, Nas put, made his daughter executive producer of, might've been either it, one of those albums. Mm -hmm. And that was like, oh shit, that's what we should be doing. That's literally, I, li I read an article about Nas doing it. I'm mm -hmm. a huge Nas fan. Right. And I was like, yo, that's fucking brilliant. Right. Yeah. She get royalties for the rest of her life. Wow. <laughs> Now, this is what's about to get interesting. You let me know if this is true. One of your baby mamas tried to scam you. Mm, Jesus. Now, correct me. I mean, I'm going to go. You you stop me. Okay. There was a child. Right. He's still. Yeah, he's, the he, child is here. Yeah. Child's here. <laughs> you were led to believe it was yours. Well, yes. It, it's so interesting because I, I got to figure out how. I've told the story before, right? And I, it might be the only time I could tell it. But I well, I'm gonna let you tell it. I was gonna set it up, but I'm gonna let you well, tell it. I, it's because it's been told before. But I, but this is what I'll say. And this is how you clear this up. And this is the grown shit. Um, we have a beautiful son together named Harlem Howery. Mm -hmm. um, he's amazing. He's autistic, mm -hmm. you know, and. We may not have the perfect relationship, because right. we don't, because it was a lot of shit she put me through. She right. really did. But at the same time, we got this beautiful baby here, and that's all the focus is on. Right. You know, look, and I'm, don't get me wrong, believe me, it was, you know, you, it was like Wendy Williams, and it was, all time, it was all the tips. It was a lot of shit. But at the same time, this the grown shit. Like, you know, he's here, and it's not, not you know. It, she was married at the time? Nah. She was married. Well, she was. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. She was married but, at the time. But, but I, look. Real. Look, no, for real. You I, deserve everything you got messing with a married woman. I didn't know she was married. She didn't tell you? She said she, they was divorced at the time. But I'm not, let me say this again. I can't, and we're talking about black people, because black people divorce different. Yeah, people. yeah, yeah, okay, okay. You know what I mean? <laughs> I left the house yesterday, yeah, yeah, so I'm yeah, divorced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, he left the house three years ago. Right, exactly. You know that shit, go. They don't do the paperwork, nobody want to pay the, right. pay the fees. Right. <laughs> they didn't have a whole relationship. Right. And so, like, I'll say, you know, once again, you know, I don't, she's, we had, we don't have the perfect relationship at all. And I didn't like any of that shit that she did. And nobody deserves any of that. Right. And, you know, but at the same time, I don't hate her for it. I'm not mad at her for it. I moved on from it. And at this point, it's just, for me, I think the focus should just be making sure we raise this little man to be the best human being he possibly be. That's that's all I care about. So like I it's 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 old news. So it's like, huh? Was it tough? Yeah, I mean anything's tough when you're well first of all it's tough being a long distance dad. Right. You know, and that that that's that's what made this whole situation very unique and you know what it was. Um and I knew that from the beginning and I, you know, I, and I tried to explain that to her, but at that time she just really wasn't she wouldn't listen. Right. Um, but man, when you, cause I get all the kids for the summer, mm -hmm. man, though, I love those summers, mm -hmm. you know, when, when I'm, you know, playing with them and talking with them and laughing with them and I'm seeing how, you know, this is what I love about Brittany and Judah, who's my oldest two, you know, because it was a, it was a lot for them. Right. You know, the day I told them that they had a little brother, possibly. I remember Brittany was young. Brittany was like, she looked six. She was like, oh, God, what the hell did you do, basically? Right. You know what I mean? But when I tell you, you know, the first time I brought Harlem home, and I had all of them with me for like, I think the holiday, one of those holidays, they stayed up with me the whole night because he was, you know, he was up. He was a baby. Mm -hmm. Brittany wouldn't put him down. 
Still though. They like this. And I, I had to have a real conversation with, with Brittany and Judah, the oldest two. It was like, I said, let me tell y'all something. I got y'all back forever. I don't, like, everybody else made me feel how they made me feel. You two have had my back. I got you forever. Mm -hmm. But also, you understand that, Daddy, I'm not a perfect human being, and you not going to be. So if anybody ain't going to judge you, it, you can tell me anything. Right. Promise you I won't judge right. you. <laughs> do, your, do your kids understand what you do, the sacrifices that you make, and that you might not be there for every event? but it's for the betterment of them. They are like, so it's so interesting you say, so Brittany and Judah understands that along with my ex-wife, right? Okay. And we co-parent with her. And, and you have to know who you with. It, I'm not gonna be able to be there for a lot of the things. Correct. You know what I'm saying? And with Harlem, you know, in his mind, sometimes it feels like, like you do know who I am, right? Like what my life is and what right. job is. And, and what you knew that when you met me. Yeah. And so like, what do you, I mean, one random day she hit me up like, could you come get him? Nigga, I'm in LA. You in Chicago. What the f <laughs> that's not possible. I'm gonna just get my private. I don't have a private, even if I had one, that's still crazy. To right. And so, you know, but, but that's an adjustment too. And that's why like co-parenting is very important. And sometimes it take a while, but I don't know, man. I like my ex-wife, me and her have figured it out in a way where I think I'm confident that, you know, with Harlem, it'll get smoother at some point. But, you know, it's not always smooth. And, you know, you're, you know, and you, you're never doing enough. Right. Of course. You know what I mean? So it's like, hey, right. I'm going to get you out here on this one. How are the kids with the fiance? Man. The kids get along well, you know, because she has four daughters. Okay. Like, that was, that's been the most coolest thing, actually, is like the way they all hit it off. Okay. It's kind of like they all hit it off. We are a family core. Okay. You know what I mean? Like, Harlem is, is, is the baby right. six. When I tell you, everybody participates when they're around, mm -hmm. everybody does. Right. And, you know, even with like, so I, I remember this is how we did it, right? So I met her two oldest first. Mm hmm. You know, they, they, they in their twenties, you know what I'm saying? So I met them first, you know, talked to them and let them know I really care about their mom, blah, blah, blah. And then the youngest kids, cause they all the, almost the same age group is mine, you know, Brittany and Judah's 14 and 13, her youngest are 13 and 12. Right. So it's all the same group. Right. The cutest thing, we all, we take them to catch. There's our little spot we like to do. And they all nervous about meeting each other. They all like literally reverence about meeting each other. And then I forgot what broke the ice. And then they all just started laughing. And the next thing you know, it was just, you know, especially for Brittany, because Brittany's around all guys. Right. You know, so for her to have like a group of girls. Girls, maybe, right. Was, like, it made her happy. So like, it's been, it's been beautiful, man, to be quite right. honest with you. I like, I've, when I shot Vacation Friends too, you know, everybody was in Hawaii, uh, which was really fun. Mm -hmm. And interesting because my ex-wife was dead and I wanted them to talk. Right. You know, I remember when I never forget that I was eating breakfast. They're like, yeah, we're going to go to the beach. I'm like, oh, shit, they got to talk. You know, yeah. <laughs> but, 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 I, but I love that. Right. You know, that, and that's a part of having a blended family. Danella is, I, she's a woman that I never thought I'd meet. Mm -hmm. Just powerful, smart, outspoken. She's an author. She's a, she's just so, she's so dope. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You know, and like her mom passed, uh, back in September and, um, I'm so gl glad I got a chance to meet Miss Sandy. And, you know, I went to Mississippi. She's from Mississippi, mm -hmm. Terry, Mississippi. And, Went down there and she got, you know, she got one of them black pops, man. But I, like, for us, we, we old black men get along. We, yeah. we the same. Right. You know what I mean? That's my mm -hmm. old everybody. Right. And, and I remember just talking with, like, we just met. He took me for a ride. I rode with him. We just talking, laughing. And she was nervous. She right. was so nervous. Like, oh, did he, am I, get? babe, Good. first of all, idiot older black man. I'm telling you, I'm fine. Right. <laughs> you, you don't have to worry about it. I can sit down with these dudes for hours. Right. Talk shit, sit on the tractor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and just talk. And so, you know, it's just been this beautiful murder. My family adores her. 
my aunts, my so uncles, so. everybody. And she's, you know, she loves my family. It's just been beautiful to be quite honest with you. So, you know, I hope nobody gets mad if we don't do a for real wedding and end up married one day. Y'all are like, wonderful. Congratulations, all the best. Appreciate you, bro. Little Ray Aubrey. Thank you, man. All my life, been grinding all my life. Sacrifice, hustle paid the price. Want a slice, got to roll the dice, that's why. All my life, I been grinding all my life. Yeah. All my life, been grinding all my life. Sacrifice, hustle paid the price. Want a slice, got to roll the dice, that's why. All my life, I been grinding all my life.